Good day, mate. Forty here. So I remember reading in the New York Times back in 2017 that uh, Ben Shapiro is the cool kids philosopher. He, he dissects arguments with a lawyer skill and references to Aristotle. Wow. New York Times quotes praise of Ben Shapiro as a brilliant polemicist and principled gladiator. Gladiator. Wow. Quick-witted man who reads books, guys. He reads books, and he takes apart arguments in ways that make the conservative conclusion seem utterly logical. Ben Shapiro is the destroyer of weak arguments. He has been called the voice of the conservative millennial movement. He is a genuine intellectual. He is a man who does not attack of barely. He does not stoke anger for the sake of it. He's not someone who mischaracterizes his opponent's positions. He is principled. He deplores Donald Trump. He cares about truth. Right? His personal mantra, facts don't care about your feelings, that captures his approach. He is passionate, but he believes in following truth and empirical observation and reason rather than emotion. He is the best in contemporary right-wing thinking, and he is the cool kids philosopher. Right? Here he is going up against... Andrew Neal back in 2017. You say in your book, you say that there's quite a key phrase, we are so angry at each other right now. But as I say, aren't you part of that anger? Aren't you encouraging that anger? For example, you you described Mr Obama's State of the Union address in 2012 as fascist mentality in action. Well, I think that if you are want, if you want to argue with the characterization, then we can talk about what exactly his State of the Union address said. Plenty of things are bad and wrong, but it doesn't make them fascist. Well, I suppose that's true. You said they should Correct. turn their badge in as a Jew. Uh, yes, I believe that if you are a, I believe that if you are somebody who takes Judaism seriously, that comes along with ideological ideological commitment. I mean, I guess. Look, for most people, religion, whether it's Judaism or Christianity or Islam, is just something that they grow up with. And taking it seriously really just means that you take your family and your extended family seriously. There aren't a whole lot of ideological commitments that come in turn with uh, just taking your family and your extended family seriously. Yes. Also, I'm just, I mean, I, mean I, I hope you're having fun, by the way, going through every old tweet that I've ever sent to try and do gotcha questions. Well, you said sure. Israelis like to build, Arabs like to bomb crap and live in open sewage. Well, as I say in an article entitled, here's a list of all the giant, bad, dumb things I've ever said. Was that, that, was list that includes, dumb? Well, yes, that's a dumb tweet. Well, Frankly, I find this whole thing a waste of time. If you want to read the book and critique the book, why don't you read and critique the book? If you want to read, if you want to critique me, you can think whatever you want of me. Why don't you frankly, just try and I don't care. The I, don't, I don't frankly give a damn what you you're, think of me since I've new, never heard of you. Now, in fairness to Ben, I don't think the interviewer did a... Right, this seems to be a British thing, that uh, the idea of a good interview is to frame questions and, and comments in the most provocative way possible to try to make the other person look as big an idiot as possible. It doesn't make for a good interview, generally speaking, but it can make for compelling viewing. This is uh, JJ McCullough out of Canada. A particularly good job here. I don't think it's that fun or useful to the audience when the host just spends like 15 straight minutes trying to get the guest to justify the worst things he's ever said. It makes the whole thing seem less like an interview and more like a trial. And as anyone who has ever been to court will tell you, trials are boring. But I do. Yeah, so I, I think that's a pretty good analysis. What makes for a good pundit? Well, what makes her a successful pundit? Free trade, because that's also the opinion of the host. So while it's important to be able to analyze just about anything that happens in the world, it is also very useful if your opinions can be sort of broadly consistent and predictable. So now he goes into the characteristics of the successful pundit. Uh, Bernard says Ben should have just doubled down if he was shitpoting, just doubled down. Yeah, so Ben is kind of torn between two sides of himself. I think there's a part of him that wants to engage in logical, rational discussion, and then there's another part of him that just wants to provoke. And the provocateur in him usually wins, but sometimes that part of him crumbles, as we saw in that exchange with Andrew Neal. So Ben Shapiro is definitely a smart guy and a successful guy. He graduated from Harvard Law School. He's got uh, the Daily Wire company with something like uh, 70 employees, and it's got over a million paid subscribers. No one that I encounter online 
is curious about my thoughts on Ben Shapiro or wants to discuss Ben Shapiro, but a lot of people I know in real life, and much of my real life is in Orthodox Judaism, comes from people who don't spend much time with politics, but when they do, they're very likely to listen to a Ben Shapiro podcast. So a lot of people I know in Orthodox Judaism largely get much of their view of the world and of politics from Ben Shapiro, and he meets their needs. And I think Ben Shapiro must be meeting a lot of needs if I assume that his growth is not just astroturfed, that to the extent that it reflects something real, he meets the needs of, what, mid-level intellects who don't want to delve too deeply into anything but just want to see the other side destroyed with facts and logic. So he's meeting an audience's needs, and he's apparently doing it very successfully. If your views are kind of all over the place, that tends to come off as a sign that you're not a very mature or organized thinker. And that's kind of unattractive. This mix of being confident, consistent, and knowledgeable might not seem like that big of a deal, but it is much harder than it looks. Having had to do this myself for many years is one of the reasons why I tend to have a lot of respect for successful pundits at the professional level, even if I don't necessarily agree with them at the... Okay, so that's the, the business formula. And Ben seems to have studied, you know, what does it take to be a successful pundit? And that seems to be his number one agenda. So it's different than a Dennis Prager for whom a punditry is just one way that he gets to take his values to, to the world. Now, in, in effect, there's really no, no meaningful difference between Ben Shapiro and Dennis Prager, though Dennis Prager does conduct his interviews and debates in a more gentlemanly and polite fashion. But overall, the effect of Dennis Prager and Ben Shapiro is pretty similar. They muddy the waters. They produce tremendous epistemic corruption, all right? They... They damage people's ability to understand the world correctly by, you know, framing things in demagogic terms. They elevate the importance of politics. They elevate the possibility of apocalypse and, and civil war. And they elevate the evil of the other side. And they will tend to make you more angry and more upset after you listen to Ben Shapiro or Dennis Prager or pretty much any other right-wing pundit. Uh, Sean Hannity, you'll be like more engaged on your in-group side and, and more angry at the out-group, the, the left, than if you'd not listen to them, which will, generally speaking, make you less functional and less effective in, in the world. So let's have a look at uh, some logical fallacies here in Ben Shapiro. You talk about kosher food. The, the original logic was that you were supposed to kill the animal in the most humane way was the idea. Now... Do I know if it's the most humane way now? I have no. That, there's there's nothing, pretty much in the in the Torah or the Bible or, or the Talmud saying that the logic behind uh, kosher is to kill the animal in the most humane way possible. But Ben Shapiro is tr just trying to put a, you know, a nice gloss on an ancient practice. And. No idea. It's but. most certainly not, Ben. <laughs> okay, well. Because <laughs> you have to slice Take it up throat. with the rabbis, man. I don't know. When Shapiro says, take it up with the rabbis, man, I don't know, that is an example of the faulty appeal to authority fallacy. Has Ben Shapiro ever had anything truly thought-provoking to say? I don't know, but he is genuinely funny at times. He is quick-witted, and he, he does have his moments where he's funny. What is the difference between a guru and a politician, between a priest and a guru? or between a pundit and a guru. So a pundit, all right, uh, is generally just talking about the particular topic at hand, say politics or economics. They're not trying to teach you how to live your life. They're not trying to create a virtual relationship with you. They're not trying to say, I am your, your friend. Come, you know, come join my in-group. And they're not trying to make proclamations about all sorts of things outside of their area specialty, such as politics or economics. So pundits usually confine themselves to a particular area and they don't try to develop a virtual relationship with you. Gurus try to shape how you go about you know, vast swaths of life and try to develop a parasocial relationship with you and you know, often engage in all sorts of dubious tactics to raise money from you. So your, your typical political or economics pundit is not out there shilling supplements, for example. See, that's using the opinion or position of an authority figure or institution of authority in place. 
and the difference between a, a priest and a guru. Okay, so if the priest is making proclamations on all sorts of things that he doesn't know anything about and trying to recruit you into his own personal in-group as opposed to the organization that he represents, then you've got more of the characteristics of the guru. If the priest is keeping his advice to things that he knows something about and he isn't trying to create his own you know, personal cult within the organization, then he's acting in his priestly function rather than as a guru. Case of an actual argument. One can be guilty of committing a faulty appeal to authority by trying to impress us or make. Does religion have things to say about money? Yeah, religion has things to say about money. So if a priest relays to you what his religion has to say about money and he is knowledgeable in that area, he is acting within his you know, priestly position. If he then goes on to make all sorts of investment advice that uh, has nothing to do with the teachings of his religion, then he's taking on the characteristics of a guru. Make us reluctant to challenge that authority's viewpoint. It just seems like he is making it up. How can you say that? Every week he keeps on changing things. He's doing it to make sure the faith... Okay. I guess I have to play this. Do not become complacent. But what is it with all the chickens? Whoa, that is teal level stuff. Way out of my league. Here's another example of the faulty appeal to authority fallacy about the 1619 project, which we will get into more later. It's not good history. There are four Pulitzer Prize winning historians who said this is not good history. Okay, be listening for the phrase, this isn't my argument, coming up here soon. The story of America is trying to fulfill the promises of the Declaration of Independence Okay, that's one story of America. The idea that there is just one story of America is uh, lowbrow, right? America, like other nation states, is a nation state formed by a particular people for themselves and for their progeny. And then in response to this combination of particular genetics, so at the time of the War of Independence, America was 75%, 80% of white Americans were from the British Isles. So it's a particular set of genetics in a particular environment struggling to adapt and survive and thrive in a particular environment which produces culture, right? Genes, environment, together, they, they produce a particular culture. So America has a particular culture. Australia has a particular culture. It's a combination of genes struggling to adapt to a particular environment. Over time, make those promises available to everybody. And this isn't my argument. This is Martin Luther King Jr.'s argument when he talks on the, in the March in Washington about fulfilling the promissory note of the Declaration of Independence. He says, we're here to cash the check, right? You issued us the check, and then you didn't let black Americans be Americans. We're here to cash the check. This is the argument Frederick Douglass, the freed slave, makes in 1852. He makes a famous speech before slavery is ended. And he says, July 4th doesn't mean anything to black Americans because we're not included in the bargain. Martin Luther King said, in the name of the flag... So we, we shouldn't expect minority groups in a nation state to have the same identification with the nation as the majority. So it, it's not weird if many uh, black Americans or Chinese Americans or Mexican Americans uh, don't feel the same excitement or feel anything at all about the majority nation state or about the leading rituals of the majority nation state. We, we shouldn't expect them to. We shouldn't uh, judge them for it. We shouldn't uh, be, be surprised when that happens. The question is, from my perspective, does the majority have the will to keep the, the ship of the nation state sailing in a direction best suited for the majority's interests? So this is what's happening in India under Modi. We've got the rise of Hindu nationalism so that now India is governed in the best interests of its approximately 80-85% Hindu majority. Uh, China is very much governed in the best interests of the approximately, what, 91, 92% Han Chinese majority, rather than in the interests of protecting the rights of minority groups such as Uyghurs. Civil rights are necessary. Okay, okay, enough of those. Let's move ahead a bit. And the, the move from L.A. being a pretty safe, fairly nice city, suburban in orientation, to just overrun with, with horror shows is really... It, it, it was a lot faster than I thought it would be, but it, it's sort of a great, you're right, it's a gradual decline and then it's just off a cliff. Obviously, this is an exaggeration here, but I'd also argue that this is an example of the either or fallacy, also known as the black or white fallacy or false dichotomy fallacy. And these are fallacies that the pundits tend to depend upon. So pundits and gurus tend to be really good at analogies and these kind of either or fallacies. 
So LA is a place with some serious problems, with some horrific problems. Uh, overall, the quality of life, particularly in West LA, is pretty good, but it's also very expensive. The either or fallacy is when someone asserts that we must choose between two things when in fact we have more than two alternatives. So here Ben is basically saying, hey, uh, it used to be a very nice suburban like city and now it is the worst city ever. You basically have two extremes when I think we all know that LA is somewhere in between. Okay, here's another example. Tell right, you're not going to get a following. You're not going to become a big hit as a pundit saying the, the truth is somewhere in between two, you know, warring positions. So this kind of voice of moderation, which is also the voice of realism, is not go going to be one that uh, sends you flying into the stratosphere as a successful pundit. How much of that is historic redlining and how much of that is an 18-year-old kid today deciding to pep a gun and shoot somebody? And yet another example. It's a shift that's happened throughout American society that, that went from the notion that men were acting like pigs and they should stop acting like pigs to what if everybody acted like pigs here's a part of the episode so this is the comment I've, I've always made about ben shapiro i've been acquainted with him for about 23 years he was a teen sensation as a published author in his teens uh, he seems to take the most conservative position possible even if he knows nothing about what he's talking about and He's pro making proclamations on so many different topics. Obviously, he cannot possibly know what he's talking about. All right, RFK Jr. is a topic of discussion with people I know in real life and online. They're incredibly excited about this guy. So let's play some of his latest comments. He's talking about bioweapons. The level I know a lot now about bioweapons because I've been doing a book on it for the past two and a half years. And um, I... And you know, the, the, what we, the technology that we now have to develop these micro, we have, we've put hundreds of millions of dollars into uh, ethnically targeted microbes. The Chinese have done the same thing. In fact, COVID-19, there's an argument that it is ethnically targeted. COVID-19 attacks certain races um, disproportionately. The, uh, the, 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 the races, Okay, so if COVID does uh, target different races disproportionately, it doesn't mean it necessarily it's a bioweapon. It's something that I did uh, misfire on early on in the epidemic, noting that uh, I think East Asians seem to have been the earliest uh, fatalities from, from COVID. I was wondering if there was anything different about the ways that their, their lungs worked, anything different about their biology and their unique predispositions that may have made them more vulnerable to COVID, that doesn't seem to have held up. But uh, different groups have different strengths, different weaknesses, different predispositions, evolved differently in different places over time. So it wouldn't be surprising if certain diseases hurt you know, certain groups more than other groups doesn't make uh, COVID a bioweapon. That are most immune, immune to COVID-19 are because of the, of the structure of the, of, um, the genetic structure, of, uh, uh, genetic differentials among different races of the, um, of the receptors, of the ACE2 receptor. Um, COVID-19 is targeted to attack uh, Caucasians and and, uh, and uh, black people. The people who are most immune are Ashkenazi Jews and, uh, and Chinese. And but not, we don't know whether it was deliberately targeted that or not, but there are papers out there that show the, you know, the, um, the racial and ethnic differential and of impact to that. We do know that the Chinese are spending hundreds of millions of dollars developing ethnic bioweapons, and we are developing ethnic bioweapons. That's where all those labs in the Ukraine are about. They're collecting Russian DNA. They're collecting Chinese DNA. So we can target people by race. Okay, it wouldn't surprise me if there are bioweapons. I'm skeptical, though, of the claims that uh, RFK Jr. is making there. I don't think he's motivated by anti-Semitism. But uh, let's have a look at this uh, new article by Colin Liddell. What the hell is Robert Kennedy Jr. playing at? Recently, he came out with some interesting comments on the origins of COVID. He warned that there were more biological weapons in the pipeline with a 50% infection fatality rate. Mainstream media 
were quick to accuse him of fomenting anti-Semitism as if that's the only thing that matters in this world. It does not. To me, what this looks like much more than America's naval gazing, naval gazing obsession with Jews is a Russian-designed paranoia map, something in which Jews have always played an important but extremely subservient role, contradistinction to their supposed control of global elites. It's nothing new. Russians have been using Christendom's semi-dormant hatred of Jews for centuries to gin up narratives and fears that serve their agenda. This is thoughtful perspective that I would not have come up with. A good case could be made that the reason Hitler offed a lot of Jews in the 1940s was because he was badly infected by bad white Russian memes in the early 1920s. Also, it wasn't just the whites. The Reds soon learned these tricks, used them all the way through the Soviet era. In the latest Russian paranoia maps that seem to be at work in the American collective subconsciousness, the internet are recent features to create a kind of synergy between anti-Semitic tropes and Sinophobic ones. This has a number of benefits. First, the old anti-Semitic tropes just generally look stale and jaded now. How much more exciting and paranoia-inducing to combine them with the fear of a new rising superpower China instead of a failing one Russia? The original purpose of Russian-pushed anti-Semitic memes was to create polarization in Western societies. So the whole thing then made sense. Later, after the Soviet Union collapsed, it also made sense for an oil-producing country like Russia to create dissension between the West and the Islamic world, all the better to create an oil-producing cartel effect. Right now, Russia's main fear is that it is the bad guy and will be widely seen as such. The longer the war in Ukraine goes on, the more hatred Russia is like to draw on itself. What the Kremlin needs to do is to find another fall guy for the world's hatred, fear, and paranoia. This is where China comes in on the hate map. But China, despite its many failings, is not seen as the bad guy quite intensely enough. This fresh meme needs to be spiced up. So JFK Jr. linking Jewish paranoia with China is perfect. It's not clear where RFK Jr. got this COVID conspiracy theory from. It's perfectly reasonable to suspect, as I do, that he is compromised in some way. As a Kennedy and a man of weak character, he's just the sort of person that the Russians would attempt to target in some sort of blackmail operation. He's helping to boost an architecture of conspiracy that seems ostensibly designed to shunt conservative small government right-wing Americans toward the country's long-suppressed isolationist tendencies, or at least give Russia a break. None of this is to say that RFK Jr. is even factually wrong about anything he's saying. It's highly probable that China, like most big military powers, is developing nasty biological weapons, and these may well take into account human DNA and racial differences. It's just highly unlikely that Jews or hardly a single race would be granted exception, exemption by the food Manchus in their Wuhan laboratories. All right, good stuff there from Colin Liddell. All right, Nathan Robinson's written some pretty sharp critiques of Ben Shapiro. Conservatives frequently claim that leftists are unwilling to engage in serious arguments. Instead, we burn things down, punch people, and throw milkshakes on them. We do this, they say, because we cannot handle the facts. We are unreasoning, feely type people, afraid of the truth. And we know that we'd be beaten in a battle of intellect. Now, one of these points should be conceded. Occasionally, a person on the left does throw a milkshake at someone. And that is because it's amusing to see arrogant... No, it's not amusing to see people being assaulted. All right, so throwing milkshakes is probably just a prelude to uh, other forms of assault, which are more serious. But uh, throwing a milkshake at someone is not amusing. It's not okay. It's not something that one should just laugh away. Bond at all, it has been with name calling and glib dismissals that don't actually address any of the points I've made. If the right really were very serious intellectuals and my arguments were as sophomoric and silly as they claimed, you'd think they'd quickly and simply debunk the fallacious arguments I'd advanced. And yet, for some reason, they don't. Consider Ben Shapiro, the cool kids philosopher. I wrote an article about Ben Shapiro, uh, which everyone should read, explaining why I think he's not actually very smart or a philosopher, uh, and is instead just a person you might think is smart because he talks quickly and confidently and seems like a nerd. I made lots of arguments, and they were very good arguments. We'll go through some of them shortly. Now, here is how Ben Shapiro described me in response. Some guy that I've really never heard of, who's uh, kind of an obscure gadfly, who... This is uh, Ben Shapiro's, like, go-to put-down. I've never heard of you. As though that has some deep significance. 
His only, as far as I can tell, his only prominence in life has come from. Ah, and this is his other, you know, how significant of you, where's your prominence come from? Uh, incidentally, I looked up uh, Ben Shapiro on Google Scholar. There is zero academic interest in Ben Shapiro, just as there's virtually zero academic interest in Dennis Prager or, you know, very little academic interest in Sean Hannity. And uh, that, that's because their ideas don't have depth. Uh, writing a piece about me for an, uh, for a magazine that he self funds uh, or funds on charitable contributions and that nobody okay because you self fund a magazine or rely on charitable contributions it says nothing about you know whether your arguments are sound or strong or not what he has ever read except for this one article about me Shapiro yeah th this idea that no one's ever read Nathan Robinson or his current affairs magazine is absurd so I'm a man of the right I basically agree I'm pretty much everything with regard to Ben Shapiro and uh, Dennis Prager and uh, I guess Sean Hannity. But the, the way they make their arguments, right, is just so weak and so dishonest frequently and so polluting of, you know, decent epistemics. Like epi epistemology refers to how do we know what is true? So Nathan Robinson begins his 2017 essay Admitting he was not immediately dazzled by the force of Ben Shapiro's intellect. I started with his controversial Berkeley speech. Toward the beginning, he addresses Antifa protesters, whom he calls communist pieces of garbage. You guys are so stupid. You can all go to hell, you pathetic, lying, stupid jackasses. Now, according to the New York Times, there is a wide gulf between Trump and Milo Yiannopoulos-style vulgar conservatism and Ben Shapiro-style logical conservatism, but it's kind of hard to see. The rest of Ben Shapiro's speech makes Botox jokes about Nancy Pelosi, is strong on insults about pusillanimous cowards, hard left morons, uncivilized barbarians, rather light on actual argumentation and substantive factual claims. So the first sign when you investigate Ben Shapiro's works that he might not be a philosopher is that he's not particularly interested in central task of philosophy, the critical scrutiny of one's own beliefs. His own worldview seems fixed and unmovable. Uh, ben Shapiro believed that uh, President Barack Obama harbored a deep hatred of Jews. I don't think that's true. Right? I've often defended Barack Obama from charges of anti-Semitism in, in the real world, in, in real life, when people on the right just assumed that because I wore a yarmulke, I would regard uh, Barack Obama as an anti-Semite. No, I just think that like with many left-wing Jews, uh, Barack Obama's a man of the left, and he will inherently regard with suspicion an ethno state such as Israel, a state that has been developed, created for a specific people, the Jewish people. And I think because of Barack Obama's upbringing, he has, he has a, a sympathy for, for brown underdogs, such as Muslims. But I, I don't think that uh, Barack Obama you know, hates Jews, right? But according to Ben, ben Shapiro, uh, Barack Obama is a philosophical fascist. I mean, absolutely absurd. His anti-Semitism is clear-cut. And how does Ben Shapiro support the charge of fascism? That Obama makes dictatorial demands, such as, I want a jobs bill on my desk without delay. And because of Barack Obama's scornful looks and high-handed put-downs directed at his political opponents, that makes him a fascist. Also, the arrogant chin-up head tilt he uses when waiting for applause. <laughs> definitely, definitely sign... Definitely a sign of a, of a fascist. Uh, ben Shapiro says Barack Obama's vision for America is a totalitarian, citing Obama's hope that the American people should have a government that matches their decency and that embodies their strength. Wow, scary totalitarianism. Uh, ben Shapiro called Rahm Emanuel, former Barack Obama chief of staff who held Israeli citizenship for two decades, whose middle name is Israel, who you know, spent considerable time in Israel, but uh, Ben Shapiro calls him a capo, right? A Jew who does the Nazis bidding. Ben Shapiro says any Jew who voted for Obama was not a Jew, but a Jew in name only serving an enemy of the Jewish people. They may eat bagels and locks, but by supporting an openly anti-Semitic administration, they are disgusting and a disgrace and the twisted and evil self-hating Jews who enjoy matzo ball soup and emerge from Jewish uteruses but nevertheless choose to undermine the Israeli government, don't care a whit about Judaism, and hold anti-Semitic views. And for a man who supposedly cares about facts rather than feelings, Ben Shapiro doesn't seem to care very much about facts at all. There are 
plenty of mistakes in his work. He's got all sorts of unsourced generalizations. Walk into any emergency room in California and illegal immigrants are the bulk of the population. There are major embarrassing bloomers, such as promoting the false rumor that Chuck Hagel received a donation from a group called Friends of Hamas. Now, even if Chuck Hagel had received a group or any politician receives a donation, uh, big deal. Uh, how can you prevent people from donating to you? Uh, ben Shapiro thinks that criticism of those like him who love wars but decline to fight in them are explicitly rejecting the U.S. Constitution itself, which provides that civilians control the military. So try to figure out the reasoning on that. Strongly against a federal ban on using cell phones while driving because it would take away drivers' freedom of choice. He believes it's morally tragic that we no longer use the police to stop people from making and watching pornography. Ben Shapiro says if por pornography is legal, there should, would be no logical reason not to legalize the murder of homeless people. Uh, ben Shapiro argues that atheism is incompatible with free will because religious people believe that free will is a gift from God. Uh, ben Shapiro praises imperialism, saying that the United States empire isn't a choice, it's a duty. So when America builds an empire, it's, it's just a moral duty, guy. Uh, maintaining U.S. global power is an end in itself, even if a million Iraqis lose their lives as a result. Uh, ben Shapiro endorsed invading countries that do not pose any immediate threat, suggesting that any Muslim nation could legitimately be, be attacked if doing so serves the interests of our global empire. This is Ben Shapiro. Did Iraq pose an immediate threat to our nation? Perhaps not. But toppling Saddam Hussein and demo democratizing Iraq prevents his future ascendance and end his material support for future threats globally. The sole principle, same principle holds true for Iran, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Egypt, Pakistan, and others. Preemption is the chief weapon of a global empire. No one said empire was easy, but it is right and good, both for Americans and for the world. So Ben Shapiro's a very confident man who consistently takes the most conservative views possible. He speaks very quickly, and he doesn't really care about what is right, but he uses very effective debating and loyally trick, lawyer tricks, insisting there's no evidence, whatever, that something is true, demands the other side, produce the evidence immediately, and when they pause for even a second or two, he'll interrupt. See, what did I tell you? No evidence. Because his opponents nasty, evil, brainless, and jackasses. And these techniques work well for a middle-brow audience. All right. His, his mantra, facts don't call, care about your feelings, is worthless if you're going to be like Ben, interpret every last fact in the way most favorable to your own preconceptions, if you're going to ignore evidence contrary to your own position and refuse to understand what your opponent's uh, saying the New York Times, but it's a sensible sounding ex Ben Shapiro fan. So he realized over time that Shapiro was just concerned with convincing other people he was right rather than actually being right. I was, of course, not wrong. I am but an insignificant gadfly, and he is the cool kids philosopher. But I'd also draw your attention to the fact that this is, as they say, not an argument. I showed that Ben Shapiro was a sloppy thinker with gaping holes in his reasoning. His reply, in essence, was, I am very famous and you are not. Now, I presume you're thinking right now, well, but Mr. Robinson, as you say, Ben Shapiro is right. You are not very famous. Why should he engage with you at all? Good point. But let us rewatch some snippets of a recent interview Shapiro did on the BBC with Spectator editor Andrew Neal. You say in your new book, uh, you suggest that America's largest struggle at the moment is, quote, the struggle for our national soul. We are so angry at each other right now. And I, I think that's true. I've just returned from the United States. But aren't you part of the problem with the way you go about your discourse, not the solution? For example, you, dis you described Mr. Obama's State of the Union address in 2012 as fascist mentality in action. You said sure. Israelis like to build, Arabs like to bomb crap and live in open sewage. It seems to me that simply going through and finding lone things that sound bad out of context and then hitting them with and then hitting people with them. Okay, there's a good essay here on uh, Ben Shapiro's bullying techniques from thepowermoves.com. So get under your opponent's skin. One of the major reasons Ben Shapiro dominates many debates is that he is really good at getting under people's skin. Now, I, I'd never see Ben Shapiro debating anyone on the left of substance. I never see him debating anyone to the right of him. 
who who is a substantial intellect. All right. So these are the things that Ben Shapiro says to get under people's skin. You're standing on the graves of dead children. You're not a real woman. I feel terrible. Why are you mainstreaming delusion? He strikes when his opponents then overreact. So he manipulates people into overreacting. He gets under their skin. He remains calm as they overreact. Then he points out to the other party that they are overacting, overreacting, that they're acting crazy and aggressive. So the other party, you know, does often look wild and over the top and they start to feel crazy. So when he can make his opponent act aggressively, he can appear calm and rational and looks like he's winning the argument. So Ben Shapiro does not usually say his opponents are acting crazy. He gets under their skin and lets them act out, and that, that's much more persuasive. He talks with great confidence, right? Talks from a place of unwavering belief in his values. He talks like he's sharing unquestionable truths. And when you talk with unwavering confidence, like you're delivering God's scripture, right, that tends to work in real life. Most people have an inborn tendency to follow the person with the most confidence. Now, this helps dictator psychopaths and snake oil salesmen build a huge following. But those are the facts of the world. So Ben is very good at conveying power and authority and confidence. And so many of his debating opponents simply give up. He's very good at ridiculing his opponents. He's got his smirks, his witty remarks, his voice tonality, his eye rolling, all sorts of indicators of contempt. He will bend facts to inflate his own authority. He loves to drop a copious amounts of statistics that make him sound like the ultimate authority on whatever he's saying. He will play the victim to hide your aggression. So he'll talk about how he was, you know, viciously bullied as a kid. And he's very good at emotional manipulation, aggression, covert aggression, and bullying. And he's great at painting himself as some smart Jewish guy who's been viciously bullied. He will accuse the other side of manipulativeness. He will get under their skin. When he loses lose the plot, all right, he'll accuse you of uh, manipulating him. He'll frame interactions in ways that uh, serve him. And when it's all over, he'll extend an olive branch. So he'll take the opponent's scalp, but then extend the olive branch to show that he's the the bigger guy. So here's Ben Shapiro's guides to... Uh... There's a reason, well, Mr. Shapiro, and you can smirk at me and you can laugh at I'm me. I'm not smirking. And you can, and you can laugh at I'm me. I'm not smirking. And you can... Is you tend to demonize people who differ from you politically by standing on the graves of the children of Sandy Hook, saying they don't seem to care enough. Standing on the grave of dead children. Wow, that's something very, very heavy to say. But... Is Ben Shapiro even worth the time spent decoding him? Isn't he just a rank embarrassment on whether you're being given a serious consideration? Uh, you're probably right. <laughs> Ouch. That's Ben Shapiro. Make no mistake, the guy is ruthless and he pulls no punches. As a matter of fact, he has done even worse. Take a look. Yes. Why are we mainstreaming delusion? Uh, it's not delusion. Why, why not would delusion. you call it delusion? Because out against you and, no, and say we'll call you delusional it wasn't case hate yeah so. that's hatred okay this is just somebody that's that's terrible. i don't hate you i yes, sympathy of course for you. i feel terrible for you no no you do hate i don't hate you i feel terrible for you look how aggressive that is but in a sneaky manipulative way it presents itself in a guise of caring i don't hate you i have seen it worked like a charm let's look it's, it's being unfeeling about the about what happened in San Diego. How dare you accuse me of standing on the graves of the children that died there? How dare you? I've seen you do it repeatedly, Pierce. Uh, ben Shapiro and the Daily Wire have the most subscribers, probably the most followers, and the most money on the right. Like I say, how dare you? I mean, you can keep saying that, but you've done it repeatedly. What you do, and I've seen you do it on, on the program. Genetics and back to the brain scans. You cut that out now, or you'll go home in an ambulance. Make no mistake, Ben Shapiro is good at what he does. He is one of the best debaters I have ever seen. To chop his head. Here are the examples. Caitlyn Jenner, I'll call him Caitlyn Jenner. No, because it's that's her. The... You're not being polite to the pronoun. Because disrespect. It... Okay, forget about the disrespect. Facts don't care about your feelings. It turns out that every chrome... Get out now, or you'll go home in an ambulance. Yeah, that seems mildly inappropriate for a political discussion.
No, I know. Well, yeah. wait, to be Making your opponent emotionally overreactive and then taking advantage of it is a typical technique of abusive men in abusive relationships. In vernacular, it's called gaslighting or crazy making. Here is an example. Are you nuts? Is that, are you fucking nuts? What's your problem? Yes, I'm nuts. Something's going on. Stop with that already. No. Enough. Stop with that. No. I'm telling you, I look. Lipped out of him. Look at it. And so, you know, I say, and so I, you know, I say this, and uh, my progression's everywhere. And, uh, <laughs> and I run, and just as I say, microaggressions lead to actual aggression. So what happened is I, I said this, and this transgender. Check out my video on dominance archetypes, because Ben Shapiro embodies the smart Alec to a T. So I'm trying to modify the audio levels, but the, this, this host here is just ridiculously loud, and the clips he plays are just ridiculously low. So I'm rushing to adjust audio levels, and unfortunately, the interaction between OBS Streamlabs and Chrome browser means that the, the, the video picture goes silent when I'm rushing back and forth here, but... Something like, what the fuck are you talking about? Are you retarded or what? Take a look. So just to get this straight. <laughs> killing, killing Fluffy the hamster, deeply wrong. I'm saying that the Boy Scouts have a standard. You must be a biological boy to be a Boy Scout. You have to be a boy to be a Boy Scout. That's okay. In the name Boy Scouts. <laughs> Well, if, if, all you, if all that putting the pencil together requires is basic use of your prefrontal cortex, then yes, your labor is alienable at lower rates than if you are a doctor. A smart Alec pro, I want to learn from you. I have seen this happening more than once with Ben Shapiro. Here is an example. Not true. It's also... Do you think it doesn't impact their identity at all or their depression? It's interesting that Ben Shapiro mainly wants to debate uh, college students, but he doesn't want to debate any substantial intellects. I think the idea that you're going to play the victim. Sales. Th threatening to lock up I had, journalists. I, I needed is... 600 officers to protect me at Berkeley. Yes, it's an elephant and an elephant. Yes, it's an elephant and an elephant. Okay, With Joe that... Biden in 2000. Yes, it's an elephant. You have to be careful with the playing the victim technique. Shapiro does it very well. So this group of like white. I'm more than happy to talk to a group of any people who will have me, but usually they protest me. <laughs> but listen now to what he says. First of all, I'm against bullying of any sort, okay? The idea that, that somebody would beat somebody up is terrible, okay? As somebody who's viciously bullied in high school, I'm not a fan of bullying. But the idea... Uh, the I suspect he... Didn't he... If he went to a religious Jewish school, uh, the idea that he was viciously bullied... I mean, it wouldn't compare to what happens in a, in a secular school. I suspect he was not getting beat up. People probably said some unkind things about him. Powerless guy. Clearly you have great security. I'm glad in a city that has uh, some 4,000 shootings to this date. You have 30 members of security just for a 59165 Jewish guy. <laughs> and, 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 and this is maybe you. a mild allocation of Thank resources. You. Of course, that makes no sense. It's not physical size that gives Shapiro power. But the fact that he can say, President that's Obama. what I call bullying. Oh, and this is astonishing. You, what's astonishing? What's about astonishing it? about it is that for weeks now, you have been saying that anybody who disagrees with your position is absurd, idiotic, and doesn't care about the dead kids in Sandy Hook. And then when I say that that's a bully tactic, you turn around and say, I'm bullying you for saying that. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. Meek. Explain to me why black kids are shooting each other in rates significantly higher than whites are shooting each other. Explain to me why 13% of the population is responsible for 50% of the murder. Explain to me why the, why the number of blacks and black kids in prison, not for... I think that I understand why people would be situation. I think that we're all born individuals, and if we can start seeing each other that way, we'll all be a lot better off. I agree. Okay, let's fast forward. We saw the Ben Shapiro meltdown here on Andrew Neal a little earlier. If you believe in enlightened, mature, and civil political discourse, do you have a record of saying a bunch of really unpleasant, nasty, and bigoted things? And Shapiro's answer to Neal was, as it was to me, I don't know who you are, I'm famous, goodbye. Shapiro even called Neal a leftist. Why don't you just say that you're on the left? 
Uh, is this so hard for you? Why can't you just be honest? <laughs> Which is funny because Andrew Neil is known in Britain as a rather loathsome right winger. When tough criticisms come Shapiro's way, Mr. I love debate becomes Mr. Sorry, who are you? I have an appointment. I have to leave now. And Shapiro has very carefully avoided face to face confrontation with any of the leftists who are really good at debate. Glenn Greenwald, for example, has offered to debate Shapiro on Israel and has been met with silence. So just incidentally, I spent more time and attention on audio levels than any other technical aspect of the show. So I'll pay far more attention to audio levels than what's going on with the screen. So often with OBS and Chrome, they're not working well together. And so you're going to get a blank screen when I have to go to my OBS to try to adjust audio levels. Shapiro offers to have Matt Brunig. Uh, for, for what it's worth on my Streamlabs OBS, I have a gain of eight on desktop audio and a gain of uh, three on my own audio. Give the People's Policy Project on his show. Uh, but presumably Shapiro then watched some clips of Brunig and realized that Brunig is actually a very smart socialist who knows what he's talking about because Brunig never appeared on the Ben Shapiro show. Now, Ben's daily podcast is just him talking and he usually doesn't have guests on uh, that uh, disagree with him. Uh so I often say that accurate criticism makes us better, and I really appreciate the frequent accurate criticism from autistic merit that my audio levels are off. And it, it's annoying. You get blasted you know, one minute, and then you can't hear clearly th the next minute. And I am the host of this show. I am the one in control of audio levels. And so when I'm doing a crap job, you know, bring it to my attention, and I will try to do better. On his Sunday show, he does have uh, some different kinds of guests, but note which side of the political spectrum they almost all come from. Is he having on the really prominent lefty sociologists, political philosophers, think tank fellows, and writers? He is not. Is this because he's asked all of them and they all declined? One very much doubts so. I realize that this may sound scandalous, but there's good reason to believe that Ben Shapiro doesn't actually care much about having an honest debate. He's known for online videos of him destroying various people, but note that these are structured in a way designed to make him look good. He, an experienced lawyer, takes on undergraduate students with them in the audience and him on the stage with the mic. In part, the setup allows him to look like he's owning them when he's I remember when the Michelle Fields incident went down all right Michelle Fields was a reporter for Breitbart and she tried to push her way into Donald Trump and she grabbed hold of Donald Trump or went reaching for Donald Trump and Donald Trump's campaign manager Lewandowski pushed her aside and Ben Shapiro along with some other hysterics said it was assault what was done to Michelle Fields and then when Breitbart read a satirical article about Ben Shapiro list, linking to his California state bar listing, which Ben Shapiro is responsible for his home address and phone number and fax number and email address on his own state bar listing. Well, Ben Shapiro listed his home address on his state bar listing that was for the public. Ben Shapiro listed his home address. Then he accused Breitbart of doxing him because they linked to information that he made publicly available. So Ben is very quick to blame others for his own stupid decisions. It's a ongoing character trait of him, which is distasteful. He's not really making very good points. Consider this well-known clip in which Ben Shapiro argues with a student about whether trans people are the gender they claim to be. And if I call you a moose, are you suddenly a moose? Okay, if I read a Okay, I don't care about uh, the left-wing position on trends. Right. Now, in order to dismiss the left as a bunch of intellectual lightweights who don't have any arguments, Shapiro has to ignore the existence of intelligent leftists. So, for example, the transgender writer Julia Serrano has a PhD in molecular biology and biochemistry from Columbia University and spent nearly two decades studying genetic is there any cram down happening? No, there's not. Then good. But it's capitalist. That's not. That's not. That's not socialist. 
It's not assuming that she thinks chromosomes aren't real or could be wished away with language, rather than thinking that it doesn't make sense to use chromosomes as the determinant. And uh, chat says, why don't you decode the decoders? And I have done that. I have two principal criticisms of the two lefty academics behind decoding the, the decoders. My number one principal criticism is that they do not make plain their own hero system, their, their own standards of what is good and great and beautiful and wonderful and fantastic in the world and what should be anathematized, right? Everyone has a hero system that contains considerable subjectivity. You know, make clear your own hero system. My hero system largely comes from Orthodox Judaism. That's, that's my hero system. My other main criticism of decoding the gurus is not really a criticism, just noting that the, the most obvious replicable fact in social sciences is that different groups have different levels of IQ leading to different life results. And the two lefties behind decoding the gurus, Chris Kavanaugh and Matt Brown, make it very clear that their number one fear in what they're doing is that their deans, their academic supervisors, will get complaining emails about them. And so they are not going to go outside of what is comfortable for their careers. And even the most blindingly obvious you know, fact in the world, in social sciences, you can't get a more replicable fact that different groups have different levels of IQ and this is the likely explanatory factor for most life differences between groups. They don't want public discussion of this. Uh, Matt Brown, a psychologist, made it clear that he wants IQ discussion limited strictly to uh, professionals. Doesn't want this leaking out into the public sphere. So they will deny all sorts of you know, blindingly obvious facts about life because it will make their life and career uncomfortable and could lead to their academic supervisors getting complaining emails. ...of which gender pronouns should apply. Now let's have a look at this clip in which Shapiro argues with a student... And J.A. says, your video reminds me of why I like Ben Shapiro. So tell me more, why do you like Ben Shapiro? He is very good at uh, giving an audience w what it wants. Okay, people on the right you know, want to condemn out groups on the left. And he's very good at giving the appearance that he's just absolutely devastating with his critiques of the left. All right, Half Galician says, I don't get something. Let me, let me scroll here through Half Galician's comments. What does he say? The left thinks merely deconstructing something makes the argument underpinning it false. No, deconstructing something is not debunking something. It's not destroying something. It is explaining how something works. So I'm kind of explaining how Ben Shapiro works. Luke is condemning them. You can't look past this. They're disingenuous cowards. They are flawed. That's what I would say. I'm deeply flawed. Ben Shapiro is deeply flawed. The decoding the guru's host are deeply flawed. But even with our flaws, I like to think that some of us still produce some you know, interesting content about socialism and worker cooperatives. I reject state socialism personally. What I'm referring to is specifically, for example, the term given to worker cooperatives, the most prominent example, the Mondragon Corporation in Spain, owned the, the uh, there is no investor or cap, like, capitalist group that pro owns the profits. When the company turns a profit, that profit is distributed among the workers, some 80,000 employees. It's a wildly successful corporation. I mean, is it a voluntary association? Is there any cram down happening? No, there's not. Then good, but it's capitalist. That's not, that's not, that's not socialist. <laughs> it's not. So Shapiro says that worker-owned enterprises, quote, aren't socialism and treats this student as dumb for not understanding what socialism is, despite declaring themselves to be a socialist. In fact, though, it's Shapiro who doesn't really understand socialism. He assumes that socialism is just having the government do things and cram them down your throat rather than uh, the private sector doing things. But that's not true. Having workers in control of their workplaces has historically been a major demand made by socialists, especially libertarian socialists. Uh, the student is actually expressing a very common position uh, that has existed throughout the socialist tradition. Shapiro assumes that the student is the one confused about socialism when he's actually just showing that he himself is unfamiliar with socialist thought and naively believes that socialism is solely synonymous with centralized state control of the economy. Now, we know that Ben Shapiro is far more concerned with making his opponents look bad than with getting to the truth. 
And those two things aren't the same thing. I can make you look bad by, say, surprising you with an argument you haven't heard and aren't quite sure how to respond to and causing you to get a little bit confused. Even if my argument turns out to be silly, I then look like the smart debater and you look like the dopey, confused, emotional SJW loser. You should have a look at Ben Shapiro's book, which is called How to Debate Leftists and Destroy Them. Now first, you should note that it's not called How to Discuss Things with Leftists and Figure Out Which One of You is Right and Concede Good Points while, that they make while trying to show your side of things. No, he just wants to humiliate people. Uh, as he says in his book, quote, you should debate a leftist if there's an... And uh, the chat says, this guy is speaking now, Nathan Robinson is making me cl clench my fist. Well, that's entirely to do with you. There's nothing dishonorable here in the arguments that Nathan Robinson's making. He's making solid arguments. Doesn't mean that they are the last word on any topic. He's coming from a left-wing perspective, but he's making solid arguments that even somebody on the right can respect his efforts here. Audience, the goal of the debate will not be to win over the leftist or to convince him or her to be friends with him or her. That person already disagrees with you and they're not going to be convinced by your words of wisdom, your sparkling rhetorical flourishes. The goal will be to destroy the leftist in as publicly a way as humanly possible. Now he then shows you how to use various kinds of strategies, which at one point he even calls parlor tricks, in order to make the leftist look bad. Things like using the right body language, or going on the offensive as quickly as possible, uh, or pretending to be more moderate than you actually are. He says that rational debate with the left is all but impossible. And so he shows you kind of how to have an irrational debate with the left instead. And when you actually look through Ben Shapiro's body of work, you see that far from being committed to facts and logic, he cares only about the facts that support a conservative worldview and ignores all of the other facts that undermine it. So let's look at a couple of examples. So he has implied that poor people in the United States essentially choose to be poor. Okay. This, I think out of all the, the videos that I, I watched recently on Ben Shapiro, this is my favorite. It's by a guy I've never heard of before. His channel's called Genetically Modified Skeptic. This horror story begins, as many often do, with the regrettable decision to open Facebook. I use Facebook in such a limited way, so it... So a lot of people are complaining about Nathan Robinson's manner. I think this guy here, Genetically Modified Skeptic, I'd give him a 10 out of 10 for his manner. I think he is friendly without being needy. I think he is empathic. I think he's reasonable. I think he comes across very well. This is, this is a great way to talk to a camera. It, it had to be my involvement in religious trauma recovery groups or, or rollerblading groups or maybe being a 28-year-old white cis man in Texas that made me a target for Ben Shapiro ads. You know, I think it was probably that last one. The post it showed me was just golden. So let's read it together. Atheism is no longer simply a belief in the absence of God. It is now an active rebuke against his existence fueled by rage and endless invective. The arguments so many employ against God are as rote and dogmatic as any kind of extremism. Ah yes, the atheist extremists. Now you might think that the worst thing atheists are known to do is smugly condescend to religious people on the internet, but they do much worse than that. They refuse to vote for any candidate that isn't openly atheistic, so he's touching on something here, which I think is important. You get all sorts of proclamations by religious people and conservatives about all the awful qualities of atheism. All atheism is, is absent belief in God. That's it. Just like secularism simply means without practicing an organized religion. So you can be an Orthodox Jew in practice and be an atheist. You can go to church every week and be an atheist. An atheist simply means that you don't have a belief in God. But people ascribe all sorts of other beliefs and behaviors just inherent in atheism that aren't there. Constantly cry persecution when minorities gain equal rights to them, the majority. They put references to their atheism on our currency. They've been infiltrating the U.S. government for decades in order to establish atheistic rule, and they've even recently tried to overturn a presidential election using violence. Oh, wait, I think I'm thinking of someone else. Religious faith. That's a good critique. Faith is maligned to exhaustion online and elsewhere unless it involves crystals and witchcraft. Athe well, atheism gets endlessly maligned too. So it's not like uh, you know, these negative comments only go away. 
and, and then these broad generalizations in this Facebook ad about atheists and atheism are ridiculous. Atheists don't just refuse the light, they now seek to extinguish it. I'll give you the fact that plenty of atheists do malign religious faith online. And Half Galatian says atheism is a distinction without a difference from nihilism. No, it's not. Your primary sense of meaning and purpose in life should come from your family, right? If you are invested in your family, if you like or love your family, your extended family, even say parts of your community and, and friends and your pursuits, your hobbies, your work, any of those things, that's where you should be getting your meaning. And that's not going to be terribly affected if you believe in God or not, right? An atheist who has a family that he has some positive feelings toward, that should provide him most of the meaning and purpose in life that he needs, even absent belief in God. On the other hand, a religious person who does not have a family like me, a 57-year-old bachelor, right? Religious people without a family, I would suspect in real life, empirical, practical terms, will struggle with all the struggles that you'd expect from someone who lacks purpose and meaning in life and be much more vulnerable to those struggles than an atheist with a family and kids. My life experience, atheists who are married with kids are far more psychologically stable, pro-social, and moral than religious people like me who are bachelors and have no kids. So that's just my life experience. What I have seen and experienced in the world is that atheists married with kids have far more, far, far more purpose, far more meaning, uh, are more pro-social, and generally behave at a higher ethical level than religious people who do not have family. I think the primary determinant of someone having meaning and purpose in their life or not is do they have a family? Are they connected to their family? Do they like their family? Sometimes they provide valid criticism, but sometimes it's just tribalistic, religious. Okay, uh, Jordan wants to jump on. So yes, absolutely. Uh, it'd be great to have you. Here's a link. So send me a link and I will, I will uh, send you an invite. Uh, Half Galatian says atheism is in the, and the backdrop of official atheism. Any strong will person will assert will that will lead to evil. There's no official atheism beyond just absent belief in God. Atheism rightly has a bad connotation. Yeah, in that I guess there, there are historical social reasons to believe that people who believe in God are going to be more you know, decent in their behavior. I'm not speaking about the individual conscience of an atheist. I'm talking about atheism as social policy. I'm not really aware of atheism as social policy. I'm aware of secularism as a social policy that uh, in a liberal society, we're not going to agree ultimately on what's right and wrong. Uh, therefore, we're going to set public policy and law on a secular basis rather than a religious basis. Oh, Jordan has a link I sent. Great. So I will look for you. I'll keep an eye out for you joining the, the stream yard and uh, glad to have you on when that, when that happens. Mostly illiterate nonsense. I'm intrigued by this elsewhere though. Where exactly is that? Like, can you think of even one real life place where anti-theism, which makes exceptions for witchcraft, dominates the culture? Like even one place? And J.A. says, I like that Ben Shapiro points out crime statistics in the that the mainstream media won't. Yes, good for Ben for doing that. I like that he explains the illogic of the pronoun police. Yes, I like that too. I like that Ben Shapiro makes many conservative arguments in an entertaining way. I like that too. So I agree with you there. If only this was backed up by facts and logic. Or like, one good example. What really gets me here is that last implication. Uh, Half Galician says, conflating punditry with demagoguery is sloppy. Yes, I like to think I draw a pretty big distinction between uh, punditry, being a guru, and being demagogic. So being a demagogic means using dishonest arguments. Right? There's nothing inherent in being a pundit that uh, you must use dishonest arguments. The difference between a pundit and a guru is that the guru will tend to make 
you know, life pronouncements about you know, broad swaths of life that he doesn't know very much about and will try to establish a virtual relationship with you. Uh, pundits are not trying to you know, establish a virtual relationship with you. They're not trying to develop a you know, parasocial relationship with you. And generally speaking, they are only making pronouncements on areas of their expertise, such as politics or economics. Education. Atheists, they're not just content to disbelieve anymore. Now they're coming for you. Get people nice and scared and then sell them a sense of security. Classic sales tactic. I respect that. Actually, no, I don't. Why am I saying that? Join me on the following episode of Debunked as I break down the many fallacies and falsehoods atheists attempt to employ against the existence of God. All right, you know where this is going. I checked out the video and I'm going to give you my thoughts. Uh, Horatius says the left seems to be against religion, or at least public religion in the public square, Christianity in the public square. They have taken their liberalism in a way that they behave like the most fervent religious zealot. Yes, that's true. So what's happened is that the, the Protestant reforming impulse has on the liberal left been transmuted into this disengaged, disembodied, reflexive, buffered, self-identity so that uh, placed great reliance on the powers of, of reason for people to you know figure out their own way in life and it tries to inculcate a certain type of discipline in people so that they think about the implications of everything that they say and how that could affect all the different sectors of the society around them and so it calls for a level of self-discipline and self-awareness that is very different from traditional conceptions of you know, every man's home is his castle and he, he has the right to, you know, share his opinions in his own home, even if they're unpopular. So it's kind of the difference between the, the, the knight who has his own castle, he's, you know, lord of the manor in his particular domain, he feels free to fart, to laugh, to get excited, to cry, to share his opinions freely, as opposed to when the national political system changes. So for the knight to retain any power and status and prestige, he must go to court. And then at court, he can't fart and laugh and cry and act and proclaim opinions as he wants to. He has to adjust his behavior so that it is acceptable, even seen as praiseworthy to all the different elements of the court. And so he has to take in, in, into mind the consideration of everything that he says and does and how it affects know everyone around him and who's rising in power who's dropping in power so the left liberal perspective on life and the type of self-discipline it wants to inculcate is much more like a courtier morality where you take into consideration the effect of everything you say and do on everyone else while traditional morality is much more kind of a lord of the manor morality where a person's home is his castle and he gets to speak freely in his castle Thoughts on it, one point at a time. Hey Taylor, I just bought something from Ben Shapiro. So you're saying you want a divorce? <laughs> so tell his wife I just bought something from Ben Shapiro. She says, uh, "Okay, you're saying that you want a you want a divorce." <laughs> but come on, genetically modified skeptic, doesn't he have a, a winning manner here? I mean, this is the way to talk to a camera. Listen, there's no way to blame people who don't believe in God because they've experienced enormous amounts of personal pain. God is apart from human beings. And if we understood the mind of God, then we would be like God in his totality, which we are not. So right out of the gate, he propagates the stereotype that atheism is an emotional reaction to hardship or that atheists are actually theists who hate God because they've experienced suffering. This is wrong. Countries which are consistently rated as the happiest in the world are also some of the most atheistic countries. Meanwhile, the consistently unhappiest countries in the world are often some of the most religious. This doesn't mean that atheism makes people happy, but it disconfirms the idea that atheism is a result of unhappiness. In fact, religiosity, not atheism, is more common among those who experience financial hardship and political instability. Countries affected by war often see an increase in religiosity. I'll link a video about this in the description so that you can learn more. Atheism more often arises in stable, prosperous societies where people don't feel they need religion to get by. I'll link a see Yeah, I think that's an important point. You get very different politics, you get a very different attitude towards life when life is relatively stable and prosperous, right? What's the old saying? There are no 
atheists in foxholes, right? When life gets tough, right, people develop a stronger in-group identity and they often have, you know, feel that, that their need for the divine or the transcendent in a much more intense manner. CBC article below that covers some of the data which suggests this so you don't have to just take my word for it. Suffice to say, Ben's opening statement is informed by the in-group protecting rhetoric of his religious community, not actual evidence. You know, I get this feeling that this kind of thing might happen. So I hear there's a dangerous heat wave going on across the United States. Let me see. So the temperature in Santa Monica is not going to be that hot, right? Probably about 75. Right now it's uh, 72 where where I am. Uh, so we, we're hitting highs of 85 yesterday. But uh, again, it's going to be about 85 a few miles inland, probably at the beach. You're going to hit a high of about 80 degrees, like scarcely a, a punishing uh, heat wave in West LA anyway often so let's keep track of it as we go i got something i can use as a kind of green screen to you know hold up and then put a graphic on so we're gonna tear one out of this which oh my god this takes up so much room on camera okay i'm gonna have to cut it down i think oh no okay that should work so that's one instance of reliance on okay Let's uh, get back to the bench pair of stereotypes. That does not mean that you're not feeling the pain that you're feeling. It doesn't mean you don't have a right to feel angry at God. And understand that the struggle with God is a part. And Huff Kalisha makes a good point. Just because you have arrived at something doesn't mean that you shouldn't recognize that it's not good for most people to believe that way. So Voltaire said, if you're going to talk about atheism, send the servants out of the room because belief in God helps many people to be more honest, more trustworthy, more law-abiding, more pro-social of religion itself. Being a religious believer is the consistent struggle with the logic of the universe, and that seems to me a deeper and more fulfilling struggle than simply pretending the universe has no meaning at all. Right, you can be an atheist and have, you know, a perfectly fine position in a church or a synagogue or some religious community as long as you don't try to spread your atheism and you're not, you know, mocking other people for their religious beliefs. So not every belief we have should we be trying to share as widely as possible. If that struggle gives you a sense of meaning, cool. Go ahead and pursue that as long as you don't hurt others in the process. Meaning is not some objective thing. Different things are meaningful to different people. Just because your religion is meaningful to you does not mean that you have an exclusive claim on meaning. Wrestling with theological questions is not very meaningful to me but I recognize that doesn't mean it can't be meaningful to someone else. Also, that line, pretending life has no meaning, is just a baseless insult. Atheists don't believe in God-given meaning, but there are other kinds which atheists both believe in and experience. Also, Ben's use of pretending once again implies that self-described atheists are actually discontented theists. I've, I've got to ask, though, why would someone who believes in exclusively God-given meaning pretend there is no meaning in life at all, especially as a response to hardship? This narrative makes no sense if you think about it, but then again, it's, it's not really supposed to. All this baseless claim about atheists is meant to do is reinforce Ben's in-group's narrative that insiders good, outsiders stupid, miserable, and bad. Let's call that smearing the outgroup. God, according to atheists, is an unnecessary. Right, that's the easiest way to develop a following as a pundit, to smear outgroups. And if you can do it within socially acceptable boundaries, then you, and you have some talent at what you're doing, then you're on your road to success. Hypothesis. The universe just is. We just are. There's no... So this is not uh, Ben Shapiro saying something off the top of the head. This is a prepared video with a prepared script that he's making here, and it's called The Atheist Delusion. No reason to search for a creator, to posit that he cares about us, to suggest that there is some higher power that bridges the gap from what is to how things ought to be. You say okay, we've got uh, Jordan here. Jordan, you need to unmute and then uh, bring you onto the stream. So when you're ready, speak up, young man. Okay, Jordan, what's going hello, on? Hello, hello. 
Hello, How's it going? Hello. That, so, yeah, all good. How are you? Um, I'm so well. I've jumped on pretty late. I was just trying to close up YouTube so we wouldn't have any interference. Um, so I did jump on late. So we're going on about Ben Shapiro and Ben Shapiro's view on atheism or what? what's the topic? Oh, just a uh, general video on Ben Shapiro, though I'm happy to talk about anything that you would like to talk about. But uh, I'm just making the point that uh, Ben Shapiro is apparently successful as a pundit because he's giving people what they want, which is basically cheap put downs of the other side. But uh, is there oh, anything that brilliant. you've heard that you want to comment on? Well, I mean, uh, I've watched a lot of it. I mean, uh, Luke, first of all, thank you for having me on. I've been listening to you since your analysis on the blood sports days, anything from JF Gareppi when you did the, uh, we have spoke on the phone actually, so you might remember me, but um, yes, uh, you did, you did, uh, you were dissecting Mark Collett, which I thought was brilliant. You said, well, he's got nothing really new to offer to the table. <laughs> and I've heard that uh, my, one of my favorite streams of yours was you and Eric Stryker. I thought that was brilliant. Um, oh yeah, that was fun. Yeah. It was brilliant. I mean, look, I'm Jewish, as, as you know, um, as to the atheism, so there's a couple of things. So yes, I've been listening to Ben Shapiro just just destroy everyone that comes in 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 in, in six foot uh, two feet of him. He's just that good. Um, he has um, ridiculed the whole transgender issue, and he's and he's doing it in a nice, he's done it in a polite way. He said, "Listen, what you do is what you do, but don't expect me to call you she or this, that, and the other." Which I can understand from his point of view. Um, as for atheism, I, I, I'm, I'm very on, on the fence with that because I've seen and I'm getting more and more more inclined to think that religion is good for people, Luke. <laughs> Especially, I'm not saying ours particularly, I'm just saying religion in general. Just that I see that people are lost without it. And, and I, I've even heard atheists say that religion is good for some people because they didn't have it, they'd probably kill themselves or go completely off the rails. So I'm getting more and more inclined to, to see how religious people in general bring up their children. Um, you know, you don't expect religious girls going out drinking, taking drugs, which I think is obviously a good thing. I just like, I, I can see how structured their life is. And uh, yeah, what do you think? No, I agree that uh, religion works well for many people, that uh, belief in God seems to work well for many people. On the other hand, you know, I've met plenty of atheists who, who are married, who have kids, who are leading, from all appearances, thriving lives. So I think it depends on the individual. Yeah. Like some yeah, people are particularly suited for a traditional religious way of life. Other people are not suited for a traditional religious way of life. And some people seem to do quite well at leading a secular, even an atheist life. And other people seem to thrive in traditional forms of religion. So I think it's very dependent on the individual what uh, type of life is going to work best for him. Oh, that's true. I agree with that as well. I was speaking to one of my friends in England recently, and he said, and he's Jewish also, and he said, you know what? He said, I've had better experience with religious Jews than I do from secular Jews. <laughs> he said that yeah. the the the, uh, um, the rudeness. I'm not saying this as a slam dunk because, like you say, everyone is different, and that is correct. But he has better experience because of the politeness, I suppose, of the warmth of a religious Jew rather than someone secular who has. No, you're right in what you're saying that, that, that you know some atheists um, uh, do leave a good a, a good structured life, and you know you don't. Know, they, they, they bring their children up absolutely absolutely but uh, this is a com this is a common thing i'm hearing now luke is um when we're when we're pointed out for doing wrong things um he a epstein or weinstein it's normally normally i'm not saying all the time it's normally secular judaism like my sect of judaism that, that we're, we're the ones seem to be giving us all a bad name and I just wondered what you, what your thought. I mean, look, I, I've said that I've I've debated anti Semites left, right, and centre, and, and my argument is people are just people, Luke. You know, yeah. you can say it's the Jews. I just say, well, that's just ridiculous because some people, people in the elites, uh, uh, especially, are not the nicest people. And you're going to get Christians, Catholics, Protestants, well, which is part of Christianity, Muslims, Hindus. You know, once you're in the elite, you you have a different. You know, there, there is probably a different view. And these people aren't the nicest people, but it's people. 
It's not Jews. It's not specifically Muslims. It's not specifically Christians. It's just people are people. So we can go on. So I suppose we can back up and go on to culture of critique, COC, as you like to call it. And it's it, it, it's been debunked. And the reason I think it, 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 it's a load of nonsense is because it, it, McDonald is looking at it. It's like we're born. He thinks we're born with an inherent gene to act a certain way. And it's not. It's learnt behaviour. Like everybody in life learns how to behave, whether you're Jewish or not. Do you agree? Or Yeah, I mean, we, we do have certain predispositions. So I, I was born with an above average uh, verbal IQ, but I was not born with athletic ability. So at best, I'm a, a mediocre athlete. You know, other people are born with extraordinary athletic skills, such as they can run very fast, but they're never going to be mathematicians. True. True. Um, yeah, no, no, you, you've got, you definitely got a point there. But what I'm saying is we're not born to want to rule the world. We're not born. I mean, someone said to me, they made a very salient point. Luke, listen to this one. This is good. As Jews, we're supposed to work for, for, for the nations. And what I mean by that is we're supposed to work, not rule, to work for, to show not, and it sounds pretentious, so please forgive me, guys, whoever's listening. This is not meant to sound pretentious, but we're we're on earth to we were chosen we're the chosen people just to show how to live a, a stru- I suppose a structured fruitful life, if that makes sense. That's what when we, we, we were chosen. It's not like oh we're the best people. It was we were chosen to do a certain job, which is work maybe for Christianity, work for other religions that aren't Jewish. And try and, and 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 show the light. Not saying that Muslims don't have that um, ability because they do, and Christians do also. You know, it, it's that's what I was told, and it, it, it seems a lot more plausible and a lot less intrusive to say, okay, we're here as Jews to to guide, not not to control. Yeah. Now, you from from our various interactions over the years, you have quite an interest in the alt right. Uh, how did that yes. that develop? How did that develop? Uh, well, I, <laughs> if I was born with a deep uh, deep deep position, so to speak, a uh, disposition. Sorry, um, I was obsessed with Nazis. From uh, uh, my grandma, Ochel um, Shalom, um, came over from Austria in the Kinder Transport, and it was ingrained ingrained it's ingrained in Ashkenazi society i think luke i think we can't avoid it you know we're we're brought up everyone hates us they want to get us you know this paranoia and i was just obsessed with nazis from a very early age just obsessed i don't know why i don't know what drew me to it i mean i saw my grandma's silent suffering i suppose because her parents were my grand great grandfather was apparently gassed in auschwitz my great grandmother there was no record of, and um, it was just something I was drawn towards. But I try, but I try, Luke. I try to be placid, like you are with Strike and like you are with my keynote. I think it's better to dis- to talk and discuss rather than attack. I'll only attack if someone's just blatantly stupid and just blaming, you know, just vile. And a lot of people, you know, I spoke to a lot especially in, in the UK, I spoke to a lot of alt writers who are perfect gentlemen, really. I know that sounds <laughs> it sounds contradictory in terms, but these people are nice people. They know I'm Jewish. They've been up to show me the utmost respect. You know, they've had a few jokes, but I'm, you know, I'm not going to cry about it. And so it's just, I want to understand. For me, it's a, fa- a fascination. I just want to understand why people hate us. And I've, 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 I've asked myself, though, Luke, I've said, is our behaviour questionable? You know, is it, is it something that we do? Are, are we bringing this on ourselves? Because many religious Jews have said that also. Um, there was one online you should watch with Joseph Cohen, a good friend of mine. He's Israel advocate. Yes. And, you, yeah, and there was a, a religious guy called Rafi. Pretty, you should watch it. You, um, I'll try and get the link. I'll send you the link. Thanks. And he is, it's, it's a bit like David, a bit like David, where David says, look, we ha- we behave a certain way and we've sort of brought this on ourselves sort of thing, um, which people have the right to think. <clears throat> and I used to get quite upset when people ragged on David so much because 
it's like Duvid originated this this point of view, and it's not. It's quite a uh, quite a few Jews have had that 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 that, that belief that yes, w- the way we behave, it, you know, has brought brought attention, not necessarily positive attention. But it's 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 caused us issues, and and more than people, you know, David isn't the only one saying that. So I was a bit upset that people were ragging on him. I spoke to David, lovely. I love him to bits. I think he's mad, mad as toast, but I think he's brilliant. I mean, he's extremely clever. Um, we don't agree on certain things, but I'm um, I'm a big fan. Like I'm a big fan of you. I mean, so, yes, it's, a, it's also yeah, it's also a biblical position that for our sins we we suffer. And so that yes. that is a common thread in the Jewish tradition that we yeah. you know look look to our own behavior as the source of our suffering and see what can we learn from you yeah. know where we might have gone wrong that have might have you know brought brought troubles upon us. Well, they say, don't they? There was rabbi saying that someone said this. So I want you to you probably know this guy, Luke. He's an extreme rabbi in America, and he said that Hitler hated us. Not because we were Jews. This is a this is a classic. He hated us because we 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 left the Torah. We we acted. We didn't. We weren't um, abiding to the Torah. And he said that was a problem for Hitler. I think that's probably one of the funniest things I've heard. But then I thought <laughs> about it. No, and then I thought about it, and I thought, well, anything's possible. Anything's possible. I mean, people have said we were warned. People have said, Lukey, that we were warned that. You know, if we don't abide to Torah, I mean, someone said to me, "You don't keep Shabbos, you're going to hell." Yeah, <laughs> he did. Yeah. He did because I went. I was do. I went to do um, Yiska for my for my mother. I went to do Yiska, and he said to me, Jordan. He said, "You know, you can't just do Yiska. You know, you don't can't just do Kaddish and and think that's okay. You've got to." You got to keep Shabbos, and people. And if you're ignorant, no, this is what he said as well. Luke. You could maybe you can capsize in this. He said, if you're ignorant, it's okay. Meaning, if you know no better, it's okay. Well, how many Jews do you think, Luke, know no better than than to keep Shabbos? Yeah, and well, there are many not. different ways of knowing. I mean, I think you really have to have ex- experienced the, the the glories of Shabbat, like Shabbat at its best is spent with with family, community, and friends. So. It's one thing like knowing intellectually that the Ten Commandments say you should keep the Sabbath, but if you haven't experienced the glories of Shabbat and the connections that you build and the, the fun that you can have on Shabbat, then you, d- you don't really know Shabbat until you've, you know, you've lived a good, healthy, fun Shabbat. Just knowing in theory that God said in Ten Commandments keep the Sabbath day is not necessarily knowing right. the holiness of right. Shabbat. Right. Um... I want to actually get back onto the all right with you because that's when I first noticed you and I first noticed you were speaking to also you were speaking to high you were spe- speaking to big faces in the art right back in the day, weren't you, Luke? You had some very high profile art writers. And for me it is it's an obsession. And I wanted to ask you what's the resurgence? Why is there a resurgence in anti Semitism? I mean, look, from what people say and this is very interesting. Duvid said this, and there is there is, there is some um, there is some truth to this. On paper, we are the most popular religion in the UK and in America when it comes to um, surveys. This is what I've been told. We're the most liked. I don't know how true that is, but the people have said that, and I've heard that numerous times. But for me, what do you think are the reasons for the resurgence of anti-Semitism? Why is it becoming? So it's like getting worse instead of better. And from the left, you know, people always say, oh, well, when it's from the right, it's, you know, it's expected. But when it's from the left, and Ben Ben said this, Ben Shapiro said this as well. He said, it's, I think he said it's swept under the carpet. Or someone else said, it's swept under the carpet. You don't want to talk about it. Well, my, my fa- favorite analogy for anti-Semitism is the eucalyptus question. So I live in California, and California, about 180 years ago, imported some eucalypti from Australia. And they planted the eucalypti, and the eucalypti outcompeted native vegetation. And so the eucalypti emit certain compounds that destroy competing forms of life under, under, underneath and beside them. And they also often outcompete native forms of life for, for water. And the eucalypti have 
you know, good points. There are advantages for planting eucalypti, but they are also bad points. And they suck up a tremendous amount of water. They outcompete native vegetation, and they're filled with oil. And so, when they catch a light, they really burn intensely. And so, yeah. when when you import something that outcompetes the, the natives in certain areas and changes the balance of life in a particular ecology, then it would make sense that, uh, say, people who love things the way they were would not be very happy with the importation of eucalypti. And so you can simply substitute eucalypti for Jews, for Asians, for Chinese, for yeah. Mexicans, yeah. for Africans, it makes whatever. Sense. It, makes it makes sense. sense. Yeah. Every form of life intrinsically rebels against any other form of life that messes with it. I think it's just right. inherent in an organism. And whatever you say about Jews, you can't say that they're particularly, you know, quiet and quiescent and uh, and, and passive. Oh, yes, we are. We, 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 we keep our heads well down. What do you mean? <laughs> no, and so right. Jews right. tend to have above average verbal IQs. They tend to be very articulate. And so I remember in the 18... I remember because I was at... No, I, I remember yeah. reading about no, how in the 1880s, yeah. In, in Germany, there'd be all sorts of political, cultural questions where one side of the argument would primarily be articulated by one group of Jews, and the other side of the argument would primarily be articulated by another set of Jews. I can understand how a German would be reading the newspaper and saying, you know, what the hell is going on here? No matter where I look, even though Jews are less than 1% of the German population, they're the ones, you know, arguing most important cultural and political issues in my country. I feel like I've been dispossessed from my own country. And so I can understand why, you know, a non-Jew just sitting back watching the news and you've got a Jew arguing the right wing side and then you've got a Jew arguing the left wing side and they might be thinking, hey, why is it that I, I see so many Jews on TV why is it that I see so many Jews making TV and I don't particularly mm. like what's on TV? I feel like my own way of life is being denigrated and I feel like yeah. they're constantly critiquing yeah. me. But if I were mm. at work to ever, say, offer some critiques of Jews and Judaism, like I would be castigated if not fired. How come Jews get you know, unlimited uh, freedom get to critique blocks. me and it's, my religion yeah. and my way of life and everything that I hold sacred? But if anyone from my team no, attempts to do the same thing against Jews, they are just driven out of polite society. I can understand why a lot of non-Jews would resent that. So I don't think, I don't think. But it uh, doesn't happen though, Luke. It's like it's a it's a myth, though, isn't it? It's like you can't criticize Jews, and it's like Halsey said. Halsey used to say, "You, you say you can't criticize Jews, right after criticizing them." <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, and, and nothing happened to Ilan Omar. Nothing happened to Mel Gibson. Nothing happened to. Ka I mean, Kanye West blew it. Okay, we can we we can all acknowledge that he blew it. But he was he he he, he went off the rails anyway. He, he bless him, is a nutcase. But I'm, what I'm saying is that, that um, plenty of people have made comments, and nothing's happened to them really. They've had a bit of a bit of badgering, and nothing for me. Well, I could be wrong. I could be wrong on this. But it's funny as well, Luke. You'd say um, there was some, there's a term called the armchair anti-Semite. So um, one of my greatest heroes, bless him, was Christopher Hitchens, who you're probably aware of. And he was talking about his friend Martin Arnes. His, his father, they called him an armchair anti-Semite. So um, Martin would say to his dad, what's it like that to be an armchair anti-Semite? But he said, well, it's, it's quite good. It's quite simple. You just look at the end credits <laughs> of a film. You say, oh, there's another one. Oh, there's a little one, <laughs> you know, not necessarily out to kill anyone. Because there are anti-Semites out there who aren't psychotic murdering you know what. And this is what, when I'm taught to them, I try and ascertain, you know, who am I talking to? How likely are they to go and blow up a synagogue? Um, yeah, so I, I, I think I, you'd I find with the people who go out and try to blow up a synagogue, these are not people, generally speaking, who are married with, with kids. These are... Okay people on the margins of society who feel a desperate need for meaning and they, you know, seize on this magic key for understanding the world around them. It just so happens to be Jews. And so th this is what gives meaning and purpose and a, a possibility of heroism. Like how often do we get to, you know, commit, you know, transcendent history defining acts of heroism? 
it's not easy to find those yeah. opportunities. It's a lot easier to find them in doing something that most people would regard as evil. But if you are sufficiently uh, far away from reality, you might seize on something that uh, sure. gives your life meaning and purpose. Sure. But would you be? Would you agree with me that some anti semites are are you can converse with them? You can, like you did with Stryker, and like you did with Mike. They were pleasant to you. They seem to like you. Um, yeah, there, there are plenty that you can yeah. talk to, and and plenty of yeah. them are uh, situational anti semites. They they may have had experiences like if you had five negative interactions in a row with a particular group you would, in all likelihood, develop some negative feelings about that group. And so... Oh, we do anyway, though, Luke. Yeah. It's inherent. It's inherent. I mean, psychologically... And my friend said this, who's married, who's marrying an Ethiopian guy, both Jewish, and she said, um, um, everyone's inherently racist, and she has a point. You are, you are wary of what's different. I mean, Luke, I will say to you, I'm not a racist. I don't believe in it. But I, I'm, I would be like you. I'm, I am sympathetic to the Europeans wanting to remain European without having people thrown out or hurt because I'm not all, I'm up for that. But I, I, I get it. Um, I, I try and take um, the Judas Maccabeus approach, who I know is also a friend of yours as well, a good, good friend of mine. Yeah, um, I, was, um, I was walking down a street near, near Beverly Hills the other day with uh, a fellow Orthodox Jew, and he starts yelling out, death to the Arabs. Like I was not, oh. I was not very happy about that. Like I don't think. No, I'm sure you were. That that's not a, a good idea. Now I understand the sentiment that that this guy right. came from Israel, and so he may very well have had friends or family who'd been, you know, murdered by Arab terrorists. So I understand oh, why any strongly identifying in group that is in a life and yeah. death struggle with an out group wishes ill, even death on an out group. It seems like the most, you know, normal, even healthy reaction in the world. But to publicly announce that in, in or by Beverly Hills, I think, is a bad, bad idea. Well, I mean, it's also slightly psychotic, but <laughs> what can you do? I, I don't know the guy. You know the guy. I mean, it, it, could, have, it could have PTSD, um, and that th sort of thing does happen. I, I completely agree with you. He could have seen some horrific things that me and you couldn't even contemplate. Um, but, yeah, well, I mean, I am... I, my, sorry, I'm sorry. Luke, do you think that my sympathetic view towards European, I, I don't know if I could say white nationalism, because can we be sympathetic, Luke, because they hate us? And I don't particularly hate blacks uh, at all. I don't hate Muslims. I just, I like good people who are nice people. But I, again, I will say I really understand and sympathize that they want to keep Britain British. They want to, you know, the Germany, German. Um, but I, I'm, I'm talking even Germans going into the UK. You should keep Britain, British, German, German, America, you know, that sort of thing. I'm not, I would certainly would never, ever support throwing out innocent people who are ethnic. I'm just saying I do, I do sympathise that the majority should be um, those who have um, the forefathers and the indigenous to the land. What do you think? Yeah, I, I broadly agree with that. I... I wouldn't, you know, announce that in every setting. It, it could really rub people the wrong way. But I think what you're talking about is is a sympathy for reality. And the reality is that we get along better with people who are similar to us, whether it's similar genetically or similar religiously or similar ideologically or culturally or via habit or, or profession. So, yeah, I think having sympathy for reality is a good idea doesn't mean that we need to announce it publicly in all settings. But yeah, it, it, it makes sense. I mean, we can recognize, you know, in other people, their own desire for self-determination. Well, I do, Luke, I have. I've spoke to an Arab friend of mine um, who identifies, uh, funny enough, as Palestinian, and he's a lovely, lovely, lovely boy, lovely guy. And I don't feel any malice or racism towards him either. You know, I don't have those feelings. I don't have racist connotations. But what I will say, racist views, but what I will say is when you say don't broadcast that, well, I'm not going to stand on the street and say uh, Britain should remain white. That's not what I mean. <laughs> I know what you're saying. Yeah. Though. I'm certainly not an, a Nazi, God forbid. But what I'm saying is I do have that 
um, sympathetic feeling for people, European people who, who are afraid, who do think they're being, I don't know how likely it is. I mean, look, I've heard they say 60 years or something, or less, there'll, there'll be a minority. I don't think that's even plausible. They're like 70, 80, I think they're over 70% now Europeans. So it would take a bit longer than that, you know, and um, I get it. All I'm saying is I get it. I'm not saying I would vote BNP, God forbid. <laughs> I'm not, like I say, I'm not a Nazi, but I, I, I'm sympathetic. I, we have Israel, Luke. We have Israel. Yeah. I know we need Israel. We do need Israel. It's not just we have it because we're Jews. It's because we need it, and, and there's been good reason. But I, I think, is that such a bad thing for, for, for Europeans to want to have their own safe space? Or, or Palestinians. Like, you can have sympathy yeah. for Palestinians' yeah. desire for an yeah. independent Palestinian state. You can have sympathy for Arabs and Muslims who don't want yeah. to see a thriving Jewish state in their midst, which they find humiliating. I can understand yeah. why they don't like it. Yeah, I think having sympathy for other groups and other points of view, we should have have some sympathy for people crossing the Mediterranean to try to build a better life in Europe. It doesn't mean that we don't want uh, immigration laws enforced in, in Europe or in the United States, but we can understand yeah. why people from uh, difficult or desperate circumstances want to create a, a better life. We, can, we should have sympathy for people who respond to Absolutely incentives. Agree. Absolutely agree. You're absolutely right. Um, hundred percent. Yeah. Um, it's just I think that sometimes the indigenous, the indigenous, or think that the, there's opening the gate and then there's opening the floodgate, so to speak. I don't know. Look, I, again, it's a lot of um, hysteria as well behind it, obviously. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, why shouldn't someone seek a better life if they're being persecuted? That's what we did, didn't we, Luke? That's what our people did. Um, we had to escape uh, persecution. Um, yeah. So well, here, here I got a, really... a quick, quick anecdote Go on, on that. Um, I've never Go had, on. I've never had any Muslim friends, uh, honestly. But I, I've developed an online friendship with a, a Muslim woman who just so happens to be beautiful and charming. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm, I'm a little more sympathetic now to the. Muslim point of view because I've established nothing wrong with that, buddy. Nothing. Yeah, exactly. And also I, I Absolutely I'm, nothing wrong with that. I'm friends with people who are in the United States illegally. I'm friends with them. So I have more because sympathy you're a good person, and empathy. Luke. You, well, yeah, I have more sympathy and empathy because they are concrete friends of mine and, and that you know, yeah. that does open you up to, you know, forms of empathy that you didn't have previously. Well, absolutely. And look, and like I say, my friend, he identifies as Palestinian and I'm OK with that. Why shouldn't he? He's not anti-Semitic. He's he's a, a very, he's a, as I say, he's a very nice boy. Why should I dislike him? Because he's Palestinian, because he's Arab, because he's Muslim. No, absolutely not. If you're a good person, I agree with you. If you're a good person, you deserve the respect. You definitely deserve the respect. Um, but yeah, look, if you met someone, and she's beautiful and she's kind and something happens between you, then go for it, my man. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I mean, she could convert but if you wanted her to. But, you know, there's no, for me, there's no rules in life. It's like people always say to me, look, they talk about conversion. And I know you're, 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 you're very well, well um, you've got a lot of knowledge on this, obviously. But... I say to them, it doesn't take a rabbi to tell you you're Jewish. If you feel Jewish, you're bloody Jewish. That's how I see it. I know that's mad. I know that's not according to halakhic laws or biblical laws. But if you feel Jewish, then you're Jewish. That's how I see it. If you want to be part of our group, you have to convert to be recognized. But there's no, who, who am I or who's anyone else to say, well, you're not Jewish? Yeah, I mean, that there is one one rule that I subscribe to, and that is you want to have the, the best possible relations with everybody that you can. And so that might yeah. mean with one neighbor, the best possible relations you can have with that one neighbor is to completely ignore him, right? Sometimes that's the <laughs> best way you can have relations with, with some people. But uh, yeah. you want to get along with everyone that you encounter to the greatest you know, possible ability without uh, selling yourself out, you know, without you know, compromising your own your own values. So, yeah, if you have, you know, people at work who are of a, you know, completely different from you, but you enjoy their company, then yeah, you want to have the best possible relations. You don't want to be going through life just needlessly antagonizing and hating on people. 
Well, it just affects your life, doesn't it? If you're mm -hmm. angry and you're hateful, it's you who's going to be miserable. And you're religious. You're religious. You know that's not part of our religion to be, you know, we're supposed to be peace-loving, kind, forgiving. Like most religions, most, like, if you find um, a, a Muslim who, who a good store Muslim, they're normally peaceful, loving, like Christians. You know, it's only the small, and we have them in ours as well, Luke. We do have a few nutters in our camp who take it to the extreme, but that's life. Um, people are going to be nutcases, are going to um, pervert uh, the Talmud. They're going to pervert the Torah. They're going to pervert the, 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 the Quran. They're going to pervert the Old Testament, the New Testament. You're just going to get people like that, and that's just the way life is. Now, you must have your own ambivalent relationship with the uh, Orthodox Judaism. I'm sure there have been times that you've been closer and times that you've been further away from traditional ways of doing things. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, when I put to, I mean, look, uh, when I put to filling on, you know, you're right. The, 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 you can't say you don't feel a, a, a sense of power, uh, not power in a bad way, <laughs> like a sense of oh, it just feels good to put to filling on or to go to shul. And, and because I can't, I can read Hebrew, I don't understand it. So my davening um, is pretty poor. But yeah, you're right. And it does. And I do get attracted to elements of Orthodox Judaism. Um, because why wouldn't, I mean, I was brought up an Orthodox Jew. Um, so, yes, I mean, I've had my problems with Judaism, but, but, but I've also had my, my love affair with Judaism, you know, that I'm a Jew and I, 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 I agree with you that, that, that there's parts that are wonderful, like you said, the family, the gathering, Shabbos dinner, Yom Tov dinner, um, the spiritual, the spiritualness, it, fasting, which I, I'm not the best at doing, Luke, I apologise, fasting on Yom Kippur, which I should do better, but that's a spiritual um, journey as well. So yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And you've also spent time in the Jewish state, which is quite different than uh, life in the United Kingdom. Well, I live there, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do live there. We have spoke, you have seen me. Yeah, like, I know, uh, yeah. It's, Oh, you do. Okay, yeah. I know you're you 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 you're, you're you're thinking of what I want people to know and what people are. I, I, listen, exactly. I don't mind. Yes, I, yeah. yeah, absolutely, and I appreciate that. No, I do live in 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 Israel, and and look, we are on the verge of something, which I'm trying to get my head around this whole judicial reform. I've got to go, but I would love to come back okay, and mate. we can talk about yep. that. We yep. could look. I would love Cheers. to talk about more the and uh, the judicial reform. But thank you so much for having me on. Uh, big fan of your show. Goodbye, everybody, and uh, everyone keep safe. God bless. Okay, cheers, mate. Bye bye. Cheers, buddy. Bye bye. Um, uh, there's a God. I say, can you prove that? You say no. I say, I don't believe you then. Atheism is more than mere agnosticism, which suggests that it is impossible to know whether God exists. By that definition of agnosticism, many religious people are agnostic. Atheism, however, adamantly opposes the idea of a God who stands behind nature. You scorn church. No, atheism doesn't adamantly oppose the idea of a God standing behind nature. It is simply absent that belief, right? I am absent all the unique beliefs of Christianity and Islam. I'm not like adamantly opposed to them. I simply don't hold them. I, I am absent beliefs in the unique perspectives of Hinduism or of you know, every other religion in the world aside from my own. But you know, I'm not uh, devoting a lot of my emotional and intellectual energy trying to debunk the, the, the case for Hinduism. I'm simply absent those beliefs. Atheism simply means a absent belief in God. Churches and the concept of God. Are these accurate criticisms? Uh, yes. I'll clarify for those who don't already know that in philosophical terms, I'm agnostic. I don't know if any gods exist, and I don't think it's possible to know if there are any gods in existence. That said, I'm happy to call myself an atheist much of the time because I live as if gods don't exist, and when I describe myself as agnostic in certain situations here in the southern U.S., people don't understand my position a lot of the time. They'll think I'm... Okay, this guy just seems... Doesn't this guy seem like he'd be a good friend, a good neighbor? He just seems like a really decent bloke, and he seems you know, very open and forthright a fence-sitting potential Christian or have no substantial opinions on religion and its role in politics here. Most self-described atheists I've ever met are the same way, actually. 
This is why I'd argue that the label atheist here in the US is sometimes more of a political identifier. So most atheists I know or have known, they're not burning with fervor against belief in God or religion. Many of them, perhaps most of them, are even pro-religion. So atheism simply means absent belief in God. It's not usually the most important thing about the atheists I know. ...than just a description of philosophical position. I say all of this because I want us to remember that this subject is complex, involving political identities and efforts just as much as philosophical ideas. After this point in the video, Ben... Yeah, I think that's important because most religious disputes are really patinas of religion covering up racial differences. So the Catholic-Protestant dispute in, in Ireland is primarily a dispute between two uh, somewhat distinct peoples, all right? It's not a dispute about theology or the, the role of the Pope and the Virgin Mary. The Arab-Israeli dispute is primarily a dispute between two distinct peoples. It's not primarily a dispute debate or an argument or a fight about theology. And uses the term atheist and atheism rather vaguely and interchangeably, so. One of my favorite jokes is a Jews walking through Belfast and he feels a gun like on a Friday night, like, you know, pointed into his back and, and the, the gunman says, you know, what are you? Are you Protestant or are you Catholic? And the Jew suddenly relaxes and he says, I, I, I'm Jewish. And the gunman says, I must be the luckiest Palestinian in Belfast tonight. We'll have to look out for that. Atheism often claims that religion corrupts mankind. If you want to make good people... Now, atheism doesn't claim anything except absence of belief in God. Some atheists have criticisms of religion, but plenty of atheists have you know, positive things to say about religion too. People do wicked things, you'll need religion. But the notion of a god blinds men to the truths around them. That science is directly opposed to the idea of a creator. Do you give them an A at least for trying to reconcile faith and reason? I don't think they're reconcilable. None of these things are true. It's also not true that atheism claims any of these things. Atheism is a singular philosophical position. Atheists might claim these things, and I've heard many of them do so, but it's strange to say that atheism does any of this. If you weren't familiar with many atheists and you heard Ben say this, you might get the impression that atheism entails certain attitudes. So if you wanted to become a pundit or an influencer or a YouTube personality, I think this guy's presentation is a terrific guide. But this is the way to come across online. Thoughtful, reasonable, getting your facts and arguments in line, open, empathic and behaviors. Self-described atheists are diverse, though. There are atheists who think that religion on the whole is a good thing. There are atheists who think the opposite, and there are atheists who are somewhere in between. When talking about groups outside of our own, as Ben is doing, it's important that we don't succumb to out-group homogeneity bias. This is the tendency to assume that the members of other groups are very similar to each other, particularly in contrast to the assumed diversity of the membership of one's own group. Groupish thinking like this is very easy to sell. It keeps things extremely conveniently simple, making quick content creation easy for the creator. It also often creates feelings of righteous superiority in those consuming the content so long as they belong to the content creator's own group. Regularly creating or consuming content like this well, people who consume the product of genetically modified skeptic, right, get all these same benefits, all right? They feel superior they feel better about themselves that they're in group and they have more negative feelings about out groups. So genetically modified skeptic also subscribes to his own faith-based hero system. It's just not a faith based in God, but it's a faith based in the powers of reason. Can make you see things in an overly simplistic way and escalate feelings of resentment for the out group. Be on the lookout for more of this rhetoric as we continue. Now, resentment against the health group is adaptive in some circumstances. Overall, I think a normal, healthy life has you know, an in-group identity at a level of 2 or 3 out of 10 in intensity, and with any in-group identity comes resentment and negative feelings against outgroups. So mild to moderate feeling of resentment against outgroups is probably quite functional, even healthy. How about we add conflation of terms here? You know, speaking of staying aware of groupish thinking, let me tell you about this video sponsor, Ground 
Okay, let's not hear about your sponsor. Special to survival? Personally, I think being able to collectively reason or believe that two predators plus two predators equals four predators, or that two pieces of fruit... Okay, that's good. I need to... Rewind. ...things we might have to decide on one way or another in order to use various forms of logic. I don't think I can agree with the rest, though. When Ben says... Oh man, I really blew it here. But we don't believe that we think 2 plus 2 equals 4 because it's evolutionarily beneficial. We believe 2 plus 2 equals 4 always and everywhere because it's true. And yeah, <laughs> you have to... Guys, you have to believe in God to believe that 2 plus 2 objectively equals 4. And that bespeaks a truth beyond the merely material. In stating that all human logic is based on assumptions, Ben is right. All forms of logic require axioms, things assumed self-evidently true without demonstration. There's no way around it. So this is where Dennis Prager got me. He said that to believe in objective good and evil, you have to believe in a transcendent source of good and evil, such as the, the Torah. You have to believe in a transcendent source of good and evil, such as God, who expresses himself in some sort of you know, written document to then have an objective basis for belief in good and evil. But that still requires all sorts of subjectivity, such as subjectivity involved in making a leap of faith to both belief in God and belief that God is the author of the Torah. And then understanding the Torah requires collective reasoning and a great deal of subjectivity in understanding what exactly the Torah is saying and how it applies you know, from a divine perspective in 2023 in the United States of America. So you can make all sorts of leaps of faith and then arrive at an objective standard of right and wrong, and you can make these subjective leaps of faith in a theistic direction, a Jewish direction, Christian, Muslim, or a secular direction. They all require subjective leaps of faith, like all intellectual discussions as this guy points out, depend upon axioms, right? Some perspective that is accepted as true, that becomes the basis for an inference. That we must assume certain things to be true in order to reason at all. Are opposites equal? Is reality intelligible? Does reality even exist? These are all things we might have to decide on one way or another in order to use various forms of logic. So whether I'm really here or, or whether Know, the law of gravity is really true or whether you know i'm looking out at a tree right life as i experience it it seems to work when i accept you know the self-evident notion that you know water is wet that uh, you know, the law of gravity applies that that which looks like concrete usually tends to have all the properties of concrete so i tend not to get lost in the philosophical weeds of you know am i really here is concrete really you know hard is gravity really working everywhere? I don't think I can agree with the rest, though. When Ben says, But we don't believe that we think 2 plus 2 equals 4 because it's evolutionarily beneficial. We believe 2 plus 2 equals 4 always and everywhere because it's true. Is he claiming that having the ability to do math or even regard something as true is not beneficial to survival? Personally, I think being able to collectively reason or believe that two predators plus two predators equals four predators, or that two pieces of fruit plus two pieces of fruit equals four pieces of fruit, might have been helpful to survival. I, I think genetically modified skeptic is so much stronger in his argumentation than Ben Shapiro here, even though I side with Ben Shapiro in that I believe in God, I believe in God who gave the Torah, I you know, believe in the traditional Orthodox Jewish approach to life, but on just the plain facts of argumentation, the logic involved, the rhetoric involved, and the way he goes about talking about things, I think genetically modified skeptic here is just light years superior to Ben Shapiro. I don't understand why math or logic isn't believed to be useful enough for survival to have developed for that purpose. Ben claims that we don't believe in truth because of our evolution, but he presents no argument or evidence for this claim. Because he says nothing to refute the idea that evolution gave rise to human logic, he could have skipped all the preamble and just said, we believe in objective truth, therefore objective truth must exist, and made the same point. This amounts to nothing but a simple appeal to human intuition. Human intuition can be wrong, though, so this isn't a good argument, if you can call it an argument at all. Appeal to intuition has a good ring to it, let's add that.
I don't think Ben is trying to prove God's existence here, but is instead trying to show that human logic depends on the assumption of God's existence as the assumption of God's existence supposedly provides ultimate justification for logic. To that I ask, why? Why tack on the assumption that God provides justification for the assumptions necessary for logic rather than just admit those assumptions are made for practical reasons? Atheist philosophers do it all the time. Is it simply too uncomfortable to admit that logic might just be a tool we created rather than some transcendent reality? I'm trying to remember something Ben said about facts or feelings. What was that? Second, we make claims with regard to morality. But what is morality without a baseline assumption that human beings have inherent worth? Even utilitarian philosophies, the attempt to ignore moral right and wrong in favor of consequentialist outcomes, the greatest good for the greatest number, for example, has to assume something about what makes an outcome good or bad. The needs of the many. So the big world is confusing and uh, very few of us can effectively rebut or refute the arguments of our group. So it probably serves an evolutionarily adaptive purpose for most people to have an unfairly derogatory view of our groups and, and their arguments. And so Ben Shapiro is you know, meeting this human need to dismiss conflicting perspectives. Outweigh the needs of the few. You can't determine the greatest good for the greatest number without determining the greatest good. And that has moral premises that have to be assumed. The belief in any moral oughts require us to believe unprovable truths that must descend from outside ourselves. So this argument, when Dennis Prager articulated, was very strong for me in my 20s. and I tried to change my life, kind of get rid of my unwanted pre-Judaism self, remake myself according to Judaism. But my compulsive, self-seeking, selfish, manipulative, <laughs> egotistical, uh, sexually voracious and attention voracious appetites just got the best of me and transcended my transcendent commitment to God and to Judaism. And the only way I was able to get myself back under control is through years of psychotherapy, years of Alexander technique, years of 12 step programs. For me, a frontal assault of trying to inculcate transcendent morality into my life did not work. So that's just my experience. It may work for you, but I think for a lot of people, they have sufficient psychological or addictive baggage that it it perverts you know, any good thing that they then try to bring into their life, whether it's self-help, uh, converting to a new religion, you know, going back to their old religion, following a guru. If, you've got, if you're sufficiently screwed up as I have been, uh, all these methods of self-help, God's help, religious help, just don't cut it. Again, I agree that moral systems require base assumptions, but I don't agree with the rest. The, uh, the chat says, Japanese people are not secular. They are overwhelmingly a secular people. I don't know on what basis you say that. Even if their government structure is something forced on them by the United States after World War II, that, that doesn't determine how they spend their, their spare time, whether or not they observe a religion. The Japanese are overwhelmingly secular. That's just a fact. Before getting into the argument, I want to draw attention to this phrasing. Even utilitarian philosophies, the attempt to ignore moral right and wrong in favor of consequentialist outcomes. This paints a picture of people who utilize utilitarian moral systems as knowing right and wrong exist objectively and transcendently, and purposely ignoring that fact. This fits right in with Ben's repeated characterizations of self-described atheists as dishonest, discontented theists. This. So my life experience is that uh, atheists are no more or less likely to be honest or dishonest, to be nice or not nice than religious people with similar levels of IQ. Now, my primary experience of atheists is that they have way above average levels of IQ. That on average, the atheists I've known have been at least as smart as I am, if, if not smarter. So therefore, people with a higher IQ tend to see the future more clearly. They tend to be more amenable more predisposed to win-win solutions. So overall, the atheists I've known lead you know, far higher quality lives than on average the religious people I've known because the atheists I've known on average have had probably two standard deviations of IQ on average above the religious people I've known. But when I compare religious people and atheists, 
you know, with similar levels of IQ, then I don't see any noticeable difference in their levels of you know, honesty, decency, and ethical behavior. It may seem like an unnecessary nitpick, but he phrases things like this so often that I think it's purposeful. In case anyone forgot, Ben thinks the outgroup is bad. That's another point for reliance on stereotypes. I could... Now, it's usually adaptive for most people to have some negative feelings about outgroups. Count this under smearing the outgroup too, I guess, but we'll just keep it simple. Okay, let's talk about constructing moral frameworks. Shapiro's moral system defines God as objectively good, and therefore derives all its edicts from the authority of and the chat says people will use anything, including religion, to virtue signal. Yes, and virtue signaling is good, right? You want people to signal that they're virtuous. You don't want people out there signaling that they're bad, right? Everything in nature signals. We are part of nature. We should be signaling too. It's important to virtue signal. Now, there are more and less effective ways of virtue signaling, right? There are more elevated and more base ways of virtue signaling. But signaling that you're a fundamentally decent, good, pro-social person is a very good thing to do even if it's not 100% honest, even if you don't always live up to what you're signaling. But overall, we want people to virtue signal. Virtue signaling is good. God. This system assumes God is good, as that idea can't be anything but an assumption. After all, as Ben said, God is apart from human beings, and if we understood the mind of God, then we would be like God in his totality, which we are not. Determining what is right and wrong for him, then, is largely a process of determining what God has seen. So this is one of the major ways that I have changed my thinking. So in my 20s, 30s, into my 40s, I was convinced that the best way to make good people was to give them a detailed step-by-step -step moral code, such as that which is presented in, in the Torah or in some forms of uh, Christianity. Uh, now that I'm in my 50s, I've come to see, just based on my life experience combined with my thinking, that the best way to get people to behave decently is to connect them with other people, such as family in particular. I overwhelmingly find that people who have positive feelings towards their family, including towards their parents, their siblings, their, their children, their spouse, they are far more likely to behave in a decent pro-social manner than religious people who are disconnected from other people, who are isolated, who don't get on well with a family or don't have a family. So I've come to see that the primary basis for ethical behavior from my empirical experience and also thinking about it logically, rationally, and, and empirically is to encourage people to form connections and bonds with other people. That seems to overwhelmingly produce more pro-social behavior. So when I'm bonded to other people, I'm thinking about the people I love when I'm alone, when I get up at 2 a.m. in the morning to write on my blog or to plot out a, a future show, because I've got certain people who are particularly important to me or who I want to impress or I want to enter their lives and so I want to do this good work on the, you know, the tiny, tiny chance that they might stumble upon it and I want to impress them. Those, those ties, those bonds, or those fetishized you know, bonds with, with other people you know, inspire me or give me strength or direct me or guide me. It, it's those bonds that I carry with me even when I'm walking all over Sydney alone, right? I, I may walk for eight hours, you know, 20 miles through the western suburb, the eastern suburbs of Sydney you know, alone, but I'm carrying with me the people that I love most in the world because what makes my journey through Sydney meaningful is that I then get to talk about it with people that love me and that I love. So... These ties to other people, I think, are the most profound source of whether someone becomes a decent or generally accent in, in a pro-social manner. Right? People who don't feel accountable, connected, you know, loved, and loving of others, they are the most dangerous, whether they are religious or secular. Said is right and wrong. A utilitarian moral system assumes that some outcomes are more desirable than others. An individual, or more likely a group of individuals, decides what these outcomes are. Then it evaluates, based on observation, what actions lead to desired outcomes and which lead to undesirable outcomes. Actions that lead to desired outcomes might be considered good, and actions that lead to undesirable outcomes, bad. So, yes, utilitarian moral systems do have to determine what good is in some sense, but they don't attempt to establish right and wrong in the same transcendent, God-derived sense that Shapiro believes in. 
even without an appeal to divine authority, though, they can still work. They're working right now in workplaces, schools, secular countries, or any place people don't appeal to divine authority, but rather to something like harm or the Yeah, just on an empirical basis, it seems like everybody has a hero system, and we can reach you know, general agreements with particularly people who are like us about what is good and bad. Wishes of the group. How is this possible? Most humans are actually really good at determining what desirable outcomes are and coming to agreement on that with others. Yeah, particularly if people are bonded. <laughs> particularly if people are connected genetically. And then it also helps if people are connected culturally, religiously, uh, ideologically, politically. Right? The, the closer people are bonded, the easier it is for them to arrive at collective moral codes. So many of us are so inherently good at this that it's almost like this trait has propagated among humans because it's been beneficial to our survival or something. All moral systems require assumptions, but these assumptions do not have to, as Ben suggested. Yeah, so this is one area where I've, I've grown. I, I didn't, didn't quite realize that uh, all moral systems, including my own, including that of traditional Judaism, depends upon certain assumptions. But it's also true for secular moral systems. Justively puts it, descend from outside of humanity. Moral cooperation can still happen without invoking God, because people are capable of coming to a consensus on desired outcomes without an assumption of God's authority. Third, we live as though we believe in choice, as though we are capable of making decisions in some way based on our own will. What in materialism would allow for such choice? How would such choice come about? If we're just balls of meat wandering around in space, how exactly do we make choices? I agree that we live as though we have choices. I'm also a determinist, someone who thinks that all events in the universe, including human decisions and actions, are causally inevitable. I don't think humans have some special ability to generate thoughts or decisions randomly or in a way that's detached from the rest of the universe. We have to live like we believe in free will. Just like we, we have to live as though we believe in objective good and evil, right? Even the most secular, the most atheist person effectively operates as though people have free will and there are objective standards for, for good and evil. It's just how we are wired. But that our psychological activity is totally dependent on prior causes. The output and even construction of our brains are dependent on input, not some abstract supernatural part of the self. Still, I, like all other determinists, live as though I have choices. How do I do this? I think a better question is how could I not do this? What does it look like to live as if you have no choices? If upon the realization that you have no choices in terms of libertarian free will, you go about your life as before, or do absolutely nothing for the rest of your life, or even end your life, is any of that acting as if you have no choices more so than any other way of acting? No. I submit that acting as though we have no choices is literally impossible regardless of your philosophical beliefs. If that's the case, then why worry about it? If we can still live normal lives while accepting determinism, then why do we need God to justify a belief in free will? Does accepting Right, if you love your family, and uh, have some friends, you appreciate your, your profession, you have some hobbies, right? For most people, that's going to meet their, their meaning needs. Now, it's usually easier in, in a very transitory, migratory country like the United States or Australia to build a family with the help of a religious community, right? Generally speaking, people choose what kind of sex life they want to have and then choose their religion based on that. If you just want to bang, you're likely to choose a secular life. If you want to get married and raise kids, right, you're very likely going to choose you know, a particular religious community because it's just easier to raise kids, generally speaking, in a religious community than lacking that. Determinism make people's lives demonstrably worse somehow? If so, Ben should present some data to back that up. Is accepting determinism simply uncomfortable to Ben? If so, he can discard it, I suppose, but he should clarify that's what he's doing for the sake of his emotional comfort, not out of some other necessity. 
God is necessary for these thoughts, or at least the possibility of God. Trash God altogether, and you can't explain why you would believe in objective truth or morality or even your own ability to choose. No, you can't believe in the same kind of objective, transcendent truth, morality, or choice as Ben if you don't assume God's existence, but as I've shown, one can still utilize logic as a practical tool, construct and participate in moral systems which foster cooperation, and go about their life as though they have choices. Yes, we must assume God's existence or the possibility of God's existence to think the way Ben does, but why must we think the way Ben does? There's no argument for that presented here, at least so far. What I worry is that his regular viewers will take these arguments as evidence that atheists have no access to truth or morality at all, even in a practical sense, even though that's not what these arguments demonstrate. Look, there's, there's no need to, to worry about Ben Shapiro. Anyone who's a, a deep thinker is not going to be spending much time with Ben Shapiro. The only, the only practical reason that I can see anyone uh, tuning into Ben Shapiro is because they don't want to put much thought, much effort into a topic, and they just want to hear that the out group is wrong. So no need, in, in my estimation, to have any concern about, uh, have much of a concern about Ben Shapiro. To the extent that people consume Ben Shapiro, I think they'll have, in many ways, a less clear understanding of reality, and it'll have a negative effect on their ability to distinguish what is true from what is false. But he does do some good work. He is funny. He is insightful at times. He provides a, a good corrective to many mainstream media perspectives. So, yeah, overall, you know, I think that uh, Ben Shapiro has a negative effect. But I, I don't think it's that dramatic. Let's, let's run uh, ben, ben Shapiro through the, uh, through the garometer, right? So the, the guru according to the decoding the gurus, all right, someone who is potentially exploitive, who produces ersatz wisdom, meaning a corrupt epistemics that creates the appearance of useful knowledge but has none of the substance. I think uh, that's pretty accurate assessment of uh, Ben Shapiro. All right, galaxy brainness, someone who presents ideas that appear to be too profound for an average mind to comprehend but are in truth reasonably trivial, if not nonsensical. Someone who presents himself as a font of wisdom and someone who possesses an all-encompassing knowledge that spans multiple disciplines and topics. Yeah, that's uh, Ben Shapiro. His arguments often link together disparate concepts such as quantum mechanics, logic, the nature of consciousness. The guru presents himself as a polymath who claims to offer novel insights with reference to many fields. Someone who eludes their own accomplishments and exaggerate them to a shameless degree. I'm not sure I've ever heard Ben Shapiro exaggerate his own accomplishment. Someone who confidently offers hot takes on technical topics and dismisses the perspectives of genuine experts. Yeah, that's uh, Ben Shapiro. So his work is largely a confidence trick that relies on his recipients being convinced of his unique intellectual powers. That's true. So if people or his recipients are expected not to dig too deeply to fully understand the references that he makes, so he's most effective when the recipient does not understand them at all. So that's, that's fair. Being a guru is a social role. A guru is only a guru if there are people who regard them as such. So a key characteristic of cults is the establishment of clear in-group and out-group identities. In-group is good, out-groups are bad. Yeah, that's uh, Ben Shapiro. So gurus tend to act in a manipulative fashion with their followers and potential allies. This will take the form of excessive flattery such as saying that their followers are more perceptive, more morally worthy, and more interested in the pursuit of truth than outsiders. Yeah, that's Ben Shapiro. Guru will often put effort into signaling a close and personal relationship with their followers, encouraging the development of delusional parasocial ideation. I am not sure what's going on there. Uh, Anti-establishment is necessary that the orthodox, the establishment, the mainstream media, and the expert consensus is largely wrong, or at least blinkered and limited, and generally incapable of grappling with the real issues. So yeah, I'd give uh, Shapiro a five out of five on that. So if a guru is merely agreeing with an expert consensus on a topic such as COVID, then there's no reason to listen to the guru. You'd want to listen to the relevant experts. So there's a trade-off. The more the guru's followers distrust standard sources of knowledge, such as that coming from government agencies or universities, the greater the perceived value that the guru provides. So 
gurus are strongly incentivized to move in the direction of bogus conspiracy theories. Uh, grievance mongering. So feelings of frustration and oppression, being excluded and disregarded, deprived of one's manifest rights and recognitions. Right, these are a potent set of negative emotions that gurus tend to tap into. Yeah, I'd give uh, Ben Shapiro a five out of five in this area. Self-aggrandizement and narcissism. It's impossible to be a guru without a sense of grandiosity and an inflated idea of one's self-importance. I'd give Ben Shapiro a five out of five here. Cassandra complex. Gurus like to claim prescience among their many talents. So this seems to be something uh, Ben Shapiro is into. Uh, revolutionary theories. Does he claim revolutionary theories? I'm not sure. Uh, pseudo profound bull. Yeah, that seems to be Ben Shapiro's stock in trade. Uh, conspiracy mongering. I'm. I think he he tends towards that. Uh, profiteering. I'm unsure about uh, that. For now, we'll reserve judgment on whether or not that's what Shapiro was aiming for. If he gives us reason to think that's the point he's actually trying to make, we'll consider it. Foreshadowing. There are those atheists who claim that logic ought to forbid God, that belief in God is not merely unevidenced, but actually irrational. I was suggesting that somebody as intelligent as Jesus would have been an atheist if he had known what we know today. In the words of Adam Gopnik, writing for The New Yorker, those who are atheists have, quote, a monopoly on legitimate forms of knowledge about the natural world. But that isn't true. It's good to hear Ben finally refer to a subset of atheists when that's who he's discussing, rather than speaking about atheism as if it's a monolith. That said, I am not one of the atheists he's referring to here. I don't think logic forbids or disproves the existence of God or gods. Logical arguments for God can be internally consistent, or in other words, logically valid. In order to show the truth of its conclusion, though, such an argument must also have premises which are true. The reason I have never found any logical argument for God's existence convincing is that I've never found one which is both logically valid and contains only true premises. So I'll give my thoughts on the argument to follow, but mainly because I think you guys would find it entertaining, not because I think logic necessarily forbids or disproves God. As it turns out, there are a bevy of logically consistent arguments offered on behalf of God. Take, for example, the first cause proof advanced by Aristotle as refined by Thomas Aquinas. Edward Fazer lays out the argument in his book, Five Proofs of the Existence of God. The argument goes something like this. First, change exists in the world. But all change is the actualization of a potential for that change. So if something is changing, it's because there was a potential for that change in the thing. No potential can be actualized unless something already actual actualizes it. So that means that all change is caused by something already actual. This means either there is an infinite regress of actualizers or there is a purely actual actualizer. This is sort of like the old joke about the philosopher and the 